Saili, you can start now. Okay. Riley, I can't hear your voice. Am I audible now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, hello everyone and good morning. Uh, well, thank you for joining us today. I'm Sally Dewey, today's host. And it is a pleasure to welcome you all in this webinar. Well, today our goal is to provide you with actionable knowledge and we encourage you to participate by asking questions and engage with us throughout the session. Well, now I'd like to introduce you the... Yeah, now, sorry. Now I'd like to introduce you the sponsor of this event that is Synergetics. Well, uh, Synergetics is learning and cloud-based company who helps organization and professional to enhance their technical capabilities and adapt to evolving digi digital landscape. Well, here are some professional courses mm -hmm. and synergy, uh, master solutions which Synergetics provides. That is a persona-based onboarding, onboarding add-on certifications, certifications add-on, reskilling, emerging technologies, certification hackathon, cloud adoption, latest technology training, sales, pre-sales training, practice, playbook, and architecting. Now moving on to the today's, well, today's webinar is organized by ETC community and sponsored by Synergetics and Microsoft. ETC community is open to all who are eager and interested to learn and explore emerging technologies. Uh, for that, you just need to follow our emerging groups uh, on Meetup community. Well, you just have to download the Meetup app on your phone or you can scan the code here and follow our groups. Now, there's a small code of conduct which everyone needs to follow. So please take a note. Uh, you cannot take the screenshot of the presentation and cannot do the screen recording. We'll be sharing you the recording to those who will attend the session till end. Now, today's speaker for this training is Mr. Mahendra Shinde sir. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently working with Synergetics as a practice head. The agenda of this session will be showing you. Yeah, it's showing on the screen. Also, there's an announcement that the upcoming ATT webinar details will be posted in the chat box. So interested participants can go check the upcoming events and please register yourself. And in the end, please make sure you follow us on our social media platform to get daily updates regarding webinar, workshops, and more. And please keep yourself updated by following us on our all social medias. Uh, we have already dropped the URL of all social medias in the chat box. Please do check. Now, without wasting a moment, I'd like to give this charge of sessions to Mahindra sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Saili. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hello. 
Hello. Am I audible to you? Yes, yes, Mahindra, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Okay, somebody has uh, posted a message. Jay has mentioned voice breaking. Is is my voice breaking? No, my rights. Oh, good. Okay, fine. Uh, so I'll I'll start the screen sharing now. Let me know once you are able to uh, view my presentation. Okay, so I hope it's visible to all of you right now. My screen is visible to all of you right now. Leveraging yes. AI for <laughs> IT operations. That's uh, this is our point of discussion for today. So before we start with this discussion about AI in IT operations or AI ops for short, I, I just wanted to know how many of you have worked in operations, system operations or IT operations. May I know who all are into IT operations, system administration, etc. You can use gestures available in uh, Microsoft Teams like raise hand, thumbs up, anything. Yeah, so Shubham, uh, this is for IT operations. IT operations means people who manage IT resources. System administrators, for example, OK? So uh, this webinar today is going to introduce AI ops to them. So whatever IT operations you were doing earlier with manual processes or maybe a little bit of automation uh, tools that were available. Now, how you AI can help you to perform these operations even more efficient ways. That is what we are going to discuss this. Actually speaking, this is more like an overview session, introduction session, because if we talk about AI ops, there are different, different products, there are different tools available, which incorporates AI into IT operations. This particular session is not tool based. This is a generic one. So even if you are not from IT operations, uh, team, even if you are not system administrator, you will be still able to, uh, you know, get some general knowledge about how AI is useful for IT operations. For data analyst and scientist, Shubham, uh, the common thing here is AI. AI and ML is used by data scientist and data analysis as well, but this is a completely different, uh, you can say, uh, prospect of using AI. AI is not only for data analysts, data scientists, and data engineers. Okay, but if you are data analyst and data scientist, you will just get to know that what are the other use cases where AI can be equally useful. And yes, there is a small, a very small component here in AI ops where uh, you will find things are very similar to how people in data analysis and data science basically use AI. We will talk about it once we start discussing the point. I will, uh, you know, highlight the similarities and differences whatsoever are there. OK. Yep. So let's get started. Uh, for using AI tools at the end of the session, I will ask you some questions like what all tools you use and based on that. Uh, we might plan in uh, future certain uh, you know, sessions based on tools. Yeah. So this is agenda for our uh, today's session. This is going to be a four hour session and uh, we are going to discuss AI for IT operations, then AI powered monitoring and incident management systems, IT operations with AI, machine learning and predictive analysis for IT operations. And last point would be best practices and future of AI ops. So these are uh, the five points we are going to uh, discuss today. Very first point, very first module introduction to IT uh, AI for IT operations. How many of you know what is AI, artificial intelligence, or at least heard about AI? Okay, so Jay and uh, who else? 
Atish Kumar. Okay, good. So two people have raised their hand so far. Shubham, good. Anybody else? Artificial intelligence, because in this session we are just assuming that people here know what is AI, at least, you know, a kind of a general knowledge, GK based question. It's totally fine if you have never implemented AI or consumed AI in any of the product. That's totally fine. OK, looks like Shubham has posted a message. AI acts as a human and can assist humans in many worlds. So basically, if you look at overall human history, right? The very good turning point or a very important turning point in human history was industrialization. Industrialization means when we started using more and more machines and factories, right, to assist multiple different types of product manufacturing or multiple different types of operations we used to do earlier. To give you a rep reference, a sample reference, earlier we had hand looms. Hand looms were basically, you know, uh, manually operated machines uh, that you can use to uh, create cloth basically by weaving threads. And then we had machine looms or uh, the, the, the me mechanical ones. The dif difference was hand looms were very slow. Machine operated ones were much faster. We had bullet carts first and then we had automobile. Automobile means the, the vehicles that we drive today. So if you compare them, the old manual systems were inefficient compared to the modern machine operated or modern machines overall. So similar analogy you can implement here or you can apply similar analogy here. Earlier, our tools, our products, our softwares were dumb. Dumb means relatively I'm speaking. You can use software. Let's say, for example, you can use Microsoft PowerPoint to create presentation and slide. But guess what? It is a user who's more important, like who's using PowerPoint to create a presentation is more important than which version of PowerPoint you are using. Agreed? Hello? Somebody might be using an older version of PowerPoint, let's say PowerPoint 2002, which is actually no longer supported by Microsoft, but still that person might be able to create a very nice looking presentation. Whereas there might be another person who's using latest version of PowerPoint, okay, latest version, but still fail to create a nice presentation at all. It is because the user is more important than the tool. The tool was dumb. Tool provide user lots of options and user need to know how to efficiently and effectively use that. Now this is something which is going to change now. How about smart tool? A very smart tool which can guide the users. How about a new product where a human do not need to or human would be assisted with important decision making? Like you are trying to create a PowerPoint presentation and PowerPoint give you a suggestion. Like for this particular slide, you might use this particular theme or you might format or you can format the text and graphic using this way. How many of you have used a uh, uh, designer feature available in Microsoft PowerPoint? That actually suggests how your presentation should be pres uh, formatted or how particular slides should be formatted. It will give you certain suggestions. Or another example would be in today's automobile industry. Uh, there are lots of vehicles we have uh, which which uses feature like ADAS. Anybody here know what is ADAS? Hello? Mahesh, Rishi, Angelo, Kesavan, anyone? No, it's an advanced driver assistance. A system will notify driver about lane change or maybe about obstructions, right? And there are multiple levels. Now there are cars which can park themselves, right? So if let's say if you are driving a BMW or if you are driving some luxury cars, which many of them now have this feature, right? Once you reach your destination, you don't have to 
worry about how to parallel park or how to diagonal park. You can use a feature which is already there available in the vehicle and ask vehicle to park itself, right? And you can just sit quiet in your driver's seat. Or you can simply exit the car, get out of it, and still car will able to park themselves. It is like an example of an AI, basically. So AI, artificial intelligence means, instead of using human intelligence, instead of totally dependent on human intelligence, use artificial intelligence in your day-to-day -day activities or in your product, which will be more faster, more efficient. But please remember, we do not expect you to totally be dependent on AI. AI is supposed to assist humans, not replace humans, basically. OK, so enough about that. So let's talk about the basic AI ML concept, role of AI in modern IT operations, and there are some key drivers about AI ops adoption that we will discuss now. The basic concept. Many a time when people talk about AI and ML, very common question I receive is, what is the difference between an AI, ML? So look at the diagram here. Artificial intelligence, a much broader term. Any technique or system that allows computer to mimic human behavior, feeling, thinking, acting, or adapting is called artificial intelligence. So it's a much broader term, as you can see. Artificial intelligence is a much broader term. Whereas ML is a subset of AI. What is ML? Machine learning, a technique used to provide artificial intelligence with the capacity to learn. OK, so. Those who use uh, data science, data engineering, you have large set of data, model data, and you train your machines or you train your machine algorithms, ML models, based on that large volume of sample data, which will be later used for further predictive analysis or further analysis. So machine learning is a technique used to provide intelligence capacity to learn. And then we have a third level, deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, uh, which is basically a machine learning algorithms uh, characterized by use of complex neural network. So if you use neural networks, it's deep learning. So these are basic terminologies people do use with AI and ML. And this is actually a horizontal one. Uh, Rishi, that's not true. Data AI is not going to replace humans in job, but there would be two categories available there. People who know AI and people who do not know AI. And people who know AI would be more efficient, faster, and more accurate compared to people who do not know AI. Let me give you an example. Uh, do you know that in, 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 in arts section, people who actually are painters, painters means people who draw some kind of uh, paintings, okay? World's renowned artist, they use brush, and paper to create their art piece. But now there is a new generation who use digital arts. Anybody heard about digital arts? Anyone? Instead of using brush and paper, they will use electronic medium to create their art. Yes? Yeah. Now, if you ask, a new age digital artist to create a piece of art, he or she can make it with his electronic device. Reputed artist win a big prize, right? Now, just tell me one thing. Now, people look at those reputed artists who do a manual art, manual arts means using paper and brush. It takes a lot longer for them to create one art piece or create one product. And if they do any mistake, they might have to tear down the paper on which they made a mistake and start a new. And you know what digital artists can do? Do you know a shortcut key control Z? Control Z. Now, literally, there may not be control Z, but there is an option available 
you can just do control z or undo 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 go back and then start doing it again and there will not be any wastage you are not wasting too many papers also so tell me one thing in future who's going to get more recognition digital artist but actually there is a different a reverse trend also in the digital era anybody who does a manual work will also be recognized but there will be very less demand for that they will be considered as classic art piece similar thing is going to happen with ai what is now expected is 80% people use ai and 20% who do not use ai will be considered as classic or legacy kind of uh, products right there would be a high demand of people who know how to use ai in every field rather even in it operations not just in data processing okay not just related to data for data unfortunately if you do not know ai or if you don't know how to use ai in your uh, data science or data engineering tools right in workflows you will be marked as obsolete okay anyways so ai is going to assist humans not to replace human i'm just going to repeat that once again fine so this is about the basic concept of ai and ml artificial intelligence machine learning and then the deep learning okay please remember one thing ai is just a tool right ai is just a tool if a digital artist if a digital artist creates some masterpiece right it will be credited to that particular artist name not the tool he or she has used right people won't say that this art piece was created by this xyz uh uh digital tool no they'll say this is made by this particular artist right so credit will be given to the humans right and responsibility or liability will also be on humans who are using those ai tool for its effectiveness for the final product and everything i guess enough of this basic concept of ai and ml is clear now what is role of ai in modern it operations what is it operations by the way every single service every single software service software product that you are using right now they need a team of it operations or a team of system engineers whose main responsibility is to make sure that their product and their services are running smoothly without any disruptions without any downtime and without any bug or without any other issues please remember one thing once you build an application please remember in it there are two different roles actually there are more roles but two primary roles i am going to discuss here developers and operations team developers are one who are uh, whose main objective is to build the software convert or translate user requirement into a finished product this is what developers do but who's going to make sure the finished product will work smoothly throughout its lifetime without any kind of issues that is operations team to give you an example we are all connected to microsoft teams right microsoft teams there is a dedicated team from microsoft whose only objective is to make sure that microsoft teams whoever users are using microsoft teams right now for any kind of meeting or any kind of this type of sessions they are all running smoothly without any downtime without any issues they will be responsible to make sure all the services are running with their optimal state and that is what it operations is now you know what is the pain area with it operations people there are lot many routine tasks right repetitive tasks they have to do every time how frequently do you think your machine your operating system need an update hello shanti prakash vedant anyone shubham shubham has mentioned frequently yes now frequently the actual frequency depends on what operating system you are using and what kind of other products you are using yes neha rishi 
depends on need, yes. Many a time, now think this way. Most of the IT operations team are managing several servers. Now, when I say several, it could be tens, hundreds, or maybe thousands. And they have to ensure that all of them are up to date. All the security updates, all the performance updates, OS patches, everything is properly installed. Whenever anything is detected, any new update is detected, install it. Many a time, there could be bugs in the operating system or the software. As soon as a bug is detected, or as soon as a downtime is detected due to a bug, these people have to com come forward, fix it, and make sure application runs smoothly. And AI can help them in their daily operations. There could be many issues that can occur while application is running. If you are using a certain product, right, and you never encountered any error, any difficulty with it, that means your operations team is working fine, or your operations team is working with their best, you can say, effort. Yes, IT operations are like managers who are responsible for smooth transaction or smooth operation, right? Customers should not find or detect any difference, any downtime, nothing. They should be able to smoothly use whatever software, whatever product they were using. Yes, it is basically responsibility with developers and operations both. But developers are the one who are implementing the requirement and operations are for actual execution. Now, you can automate routine tasks. That is one aspect of AI. Okay. Now, when I say automation of IT uh, routine tasks, that is, for example, system monitoring. How many systems are currently used running in optimal state? Let's say there is a machine whose CPU utilization has already touched 90% CPU. Okay, or 99% memory. You know what happens if a particular process is using too much of memory, more than what is assigned to it? In our IT operations field, we uh, most of the time certain applications which are using more than assigned memory, they will be killed by OS. Have you heard about a term called uh, OOM killed? Anyone? A process which gets OM killed. OM killed means operating system simply terminated the process because it's trying to use more than assigned amount of memory. Right? As an IT operations guy, you need to make sure that none of your process do that. And if a process is using too much of memory or if process is frozen or it is already OM killed, you need to make sure that it's restarted automatically. So as soon as a process fails, go and launch it again to make sure end user will not find or end user will not feel any kind of downtime at all because you are correcting it behind the scene. That is kind of a routine task you will do. Monitor the system. Log analysis. Almost every application generate log, right? Analyze the log. Now here, it is very similar to data science and data engineering. Let me tell you why. Most of the application generate a log, and inside the log, what it will do is it will detect what is written inside the log. Let's say you are using an e-commerce application. On the e-commerce application, you placed, or one of the customer placed an order. One of the customer placed an order. Now, at the exact same time, there were 10,000 different orders received by your system. And out of 10,000 orders, there were some 100 random orders which actually failed because maybe a payment issue or some other kind of server issue. Now, if you are using IT operations properly, your system used need to capture those details. Like if your order failed to process, the system should react on it immediately. Send a message to the a target customer saying that your last operation has failed, right? Amount will be reversed to your account in so and so days, right? Uh, sorry for the inconvenience, whatever it is, a pre created message will be immediately dropped to the customer saying that this is what has happened. This is called log analysis. And if you are getting action on it, it's called incident response, right? It should all happen automatically. Now, do you know that 
in India now the people use UPI, uni universal uh, or uniform payment interface. If a transaction is failed, it automatically captures that failed a transaction. Just give me a minute. Okay, sorry. So uh, we perform this type of operations automatically, and if you use AI, you may not actually need any human intervention at all. Think this way. Error occurred, some orders failed, and system automatically, uh, you know, raise an incidence, and automatically there are workflows which will automatically take care of it without waiting for human to act on it. Proactive issue detection and resolution. This is the point I was discussing. So whenever an issue occurs, system already know what to do in those issues. Like if order has failed, you have to return the amount paid to the customer. So your system already knows about it. This is the AI in operations, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence know what to do in if, if case if these, these, these type of issues occur. Enhance monitoring and alerting. What is monitoring? All the application and server requires monitoring. AI system can monitor your resources and send an alert to your administrators. Something like the system is going to crash now because some kind of error has detected. It will give you a preventive kind of analysis. It will do a preventive analysis. It will identify the patterns, the common patterns, and it will notify you that if you don't take an action now, right? It's going to crash. It is like those vehicles with ADAS, right? They have a system where they can notify the driver if he or she is, you can say, breaking the lane or moving out of a given lane, right? Lane alert. There are even cars where car itself will automatically shift into a right lane and it doesn't require any input from the driver. It will first alert driver, give a warning, and then move the uh, vehicle to the correct position automatically without any input. That is AI. Okay, so monitor alert based on a model AI has built. Optimize resource management. What is resource management? Resource means software, servers, hardware, software, everything. What is optimizing resource management? Optimizing resource management means, let's say, for example, uh, you have deployed your application on cloud and your application is currently having very less kind of user workload. What you can do in that case, if the amount of workload is very less, what you could do is you can scale down your resources to a smaller size. And you know what is benefit of scaling down your overall resources if you are already on cloud? Scaling down resources means reducing the cost. Okay, Sneha has mentioned, uh, explain how to solve issue of OAM kill. There's only one answer, Sneha. Once a process is OAM killed, create another clone or copy of the same process. It is literally like a restarting it. Okay, and allow that new process to replace the old OAM killed process and try to do it as fast as possible. As soon as you get a trigger that one of the process got killed because of overutilization of memory, create a new replica of that process and allow that replica to immediately take over whatever task old one was doing. Now, tell me one thing. If you depend on human intervention, like certain processes are killed, and unless somebody logs into the operations uh, system, check what all services are OAM killed, then go and manually launch them. It might take longer time. But what if an automated system can automatically restart? Now, this is called self healing. Okay, this feature is called self healing. Okay, yeah. Now, back to the optimized resource management. 
uh, restarting service will not cause system downtime. There would be a negligible system downtime. Means end users won't even feel a difference. It is like one time your request failed because server not found, and then after you refresh it, connect again. So your support team would would have very you know kind of an easy task. Somebody raised a complaint. I'm not able to connect, and the support guy over a phone will simply say, "Okay, did you try to refresh?" Customer will refresh and it works time. A customer will feel that something done by this customer care executive. When I told my customer care executive our service is not responding, right? What customer care executive told me to re refresh and try again and it worked. Actually speaking, the customer care executive didn't do anything. He or she simply had a faith in the system that it might have already restarted the servers behind the scene. Actual implementation, it depends on different types of technologies and tools which you might use. OK. Yeah, now back to the resource management, optimized resource management. You can scale up and scale down the resources. As and when required, AI will help you with that. AI can tell you that, for example, morning 9 to 11, there would be a heavy traffic to your application. So it will scale your application 10 minutes before you receive the heavy traffic. How does it know when when you will get heavy traffic? Machine learning. It already has prepared a model that generally this application receives heavy traffic based on past data. Yes, Shubham, that's right. Based on past data, your AI system already knows that this is the time when your server will receive a lot of request or a lot of workload, right? And it also knows when it will get lesser kind of a workload. And in that case, you know what it will do? It will scale down the applications and servers because there is nothing more to do. Right? That is one use of AI in IT operations. Improved incident response and recovery. Same point again as proactive issue detection and resol resolution. Improved incidents response means whatever incidents might happen, your AI system will be able to quickly respond and recover from that event without any kind of without any kind of uh, interference from the humans. Okay. Now the key driver. Now why do I need AI in IT operations? One reason: complexity of IT environment. IT environments have become very complex now. IT environments are become very complex because two different trends. Number one, cloud. Lots of people are now using cloud and the cloud IT environments are very dynamic. Right now your application is backed by 10 servers, right? But next one hour, it might be backed by 100 servers. And then after two hours, it is down to 10 servers again automatic auto scale up, scale down kind of because you are using cloud or there is an organization who is using hybrid cloud. What is hybrid cloud? Any idea? Hybrid cloud means there is an organization who is using both cloud and no, it's not mixed mixture of two companies. It is mixture of on premise data center with cloud. So IT infrastructure become very complex due to that. There are also organizations who are using multiple cloud platforms at once, more than one cloud platform. So there is an organization, let's say, who's using three cloud platforms at once. Microsoft, Azure, Amazon, AWS, and Google GCP, all three at once. Then we call it multi-cloud environment. So your IT environment becomes very complex. Yes, Neha, for cost and features availability. Now these type of environment, when environment become too complex, it becomes too difficult for a small team of IT operations guys to manage those environment. If your environment is more complex, you have to appoint more people to manage the complex environment. But is there a way you can manage complex IT environments without employing many people for it? Or can we make sure that just a small team can manage all the complex environment efficiently? 
that's where you will use AI. Without AI, if it is manual operations, you need more people for more complex IT environment. Growing data volumes. Now this is again, let's go back to data science and data engineering. Now people who are here with data engineering background, what kind of data or what volume of data do you process? Do you know there is also a term called big data analysis? You get large volume of data captured from multiple different sources and you might have to do ETL like extract, transform and then uh, load. Simple operation. Now think this way. You have an application which is already a multi cloud application. It was actually simultaneously deployed on 100 different servers and from every server it is generating a log. You have to consume all that log into one central system. Do the processing, remove unwanted data from it, remove the verbose output like server started in 2000 second. Services loaded in 100 seconds. You don't need that data, so you filter it out and only essential data you extract from it. That requires processing that large volume of data requires. More automated tools and more AI driven tool. A tool who can identify noise from the data and guess what? In IT operations, the logs generated. Uh, you may, may or may not be surprised. Let's say if your servers or your data center is generating 10 GB of logs. Let's take an assumption it's 10 GB of log. You know how much would be actual useful log from those 10 GB? Around 200, 300 MB would be useful log. And the, all the others are just noise. Many a times. Yeah, I will show you how the log looks alike. OK, so to give you an example. To give you an example, uh, there is a tool used by Java developers called Apache Tomcat which is a server uh, tool or you can say uh, a sublet container with HTTP server built into it. Every time you launch Tomcat, it generates a log. OK, on every execution, it generates a log. Let me check if I can show you some of the previously generated log. Looks like I have just deleted everything from the log directory. Log directory, I normally delete log directory because uh, it take up a lot of space on my machine if I don't delete it. Yeah, you can see it here. This is, for example, a log file generated by Apache Tomcat. Now, this is how a log looks alike. Usually, it's like a date time, timestamp, year, month, day, hours, milliseconds, etc. And these are the log entries. You will notice most of the log entries are info messages. Did you notice the info messages here? Hello? And every time I launch Tomcat, it is going to generate this amount of log. Now let me tell you one thing. Up to this, wait a second, where it is? I'm just looking for a message called Tomcat server started. Yes, sorry. These messages, these lines of messages are generated every time you start Tomcat. Now, don't you think it's too much of messages just for one execution? Hello? And all these are info messages. Out of 1000 lines, more than half of them are just info messages which you may not actually need or which may not have any kind of issues inside it. So that's all the noise inside your data. And remember the data volumes increase too much. And you know what is problem with log logs generated by application? I'll give you an example. There was once a cloud engineer who came to me and he had this query. He said uh, he was using he was using some Linux based workload. He had 
Ubuntu Linux machine deployed, and inside that machine, whatever bigger hard disk he assigned to the machine uh, attached to the VM, there was a recurrent issue. After few days or month, he used to get low disk space error on his server. Why? Because all the software components deployed were generating lot of logs. And one time there was a log folder with around 20 GB size. There was a log folder with around 20 GB storage consumption. And you know what we had to do? We have to create a script. Actually, there is already a tool available in Linux servers, which is called log rotate, which can uh, you know, archive the old logs, which are older than certain days, compress them into a tarball, and if they are too old, maybe an year old, delete them to clean up the disk space, right? So this type of data volume, log volumes keep increasing, and it becomes very difficult to manage them. You cannot just keep the logs. Yes, logs are basically what that particular application is doing at real time. To show you an example once again, what all things were there? It is actually giving you a complete timeline of what exactly Tomcat is doing exactly at this point. Did you notice this? This is the date and time, and it is showing me what Tomcat is doing at this time. So log is basically a very important, uh, you can say, component for any IT operations or IT uh, administrator. Because if your system crashed, how do you troubleshoot or how do you uh, perform a root cause analysis? You have to look inside a log. So what exactly did happen in the system when the servers crashed? You can go and check it there. Those are the log files. And they contain both necessary and un unnecessary data. How do you identify what data is necessary data and what data is unnecessary data? Do you believe you can employ a human to keep reading the dot .log file, select the lines which are not required, select them, delete them, and keep the lines which are required? If you appoint a human to do that, it's going to be a two time consuming task, right? But what about there is an AI which already know what is useful and what is not useful because that AI was trained with certain model data. It knows how to differentiate noise from the useful data. That is again one use case for AI. OK. Will it increase the operational efficiency? Anybody, any idea what is operational efficiency? What is operational efficiency? How easily you can operate or how easily you can manage certain operations. That is operational efficiency. How quickly you can get the things done in a right way. That is operational efficiency. Right? AI in ops or AI ops in general increase the operational efficiency and also cost reduction. Cost reduction is actually a different point. Cost reduction means because you do not have to employ too many people to manage same set of server. It will lower the overall cost. So instead of managing one person managing one server, it's bad for business. But one person managing 100 servers is good for the business. Only difference is one person managing one server was manual approach. One person managing 100 servers, it will probably use automation and AI. Is that clear? Yes. OK. Alert fatigue in AI team. Now this is something totally, uh, you know, a new term for many of you. What is alert fatigue? How many of you do use Android phones? Everyone? Every morning you wake up, you take your phone, you will see there are lots of notifications on your screen. And what many of us do? Clear them all with single tap. We don't actually go and read each and one, each and every notification. There might be some exceptional people who actually go through all the notification and see what it is all about. But many of us, we use a shortcut. Clear all notifications at once. 
last time I checked, iPhone users have to, you know, uh, clear one notification at a time, slap them. Android users can remove all of them. That is called alert fatigue. There are too many notifications getting sent to you and you don't know which one is important and which one is not important. If you open your personal inbox, let's say Gmail, you will notice there are a lot many notifications, lot, lot many automated messages you are receiving from multiple different websites wherever you have registered with your Gmail ID. And most of the time those are useless for you. It becomes very difficult to identify which one is important one and which one is not important one. AI can help you in this area. And last, shift towards proactive operations. What is proactive operations? What do you mean by proactive? See, there are two types of operations, reactive operations and proactive operations. Reactive is the old way. Reactive means I will do something only when some error occurs or only when something crashes. That is a reactive approach. And what is proactive approach? Proactive is making sure nothing fails. In a reactive approach, you, you, say, you stay silent unless there is no crash, unless there is no some issue, right? But in proactive approach, you make sure that everything works fine. You don't actually check your system only when there is an error, but you keep checking it. If there is a slight variation detected anywhere in your system, you go and try to fix it. Try to fix the issues or try to make sure that there are no issues encountered in your operations. That is proactive approach. OK. Now last point. So what is AI ops? Now this is not a last point. After this point, we are going to take uh, a small break. OK. After this point, it will take around 10 minutes and then we will continue again. So what is AI ops? So I'm going to give you a definition of AI ops and its, uh, its uh, uh, concept and its life cycle. Now the life cycle of AI ops, you will notice there are some similarities and differences between AI ops and data science. Anyways, so let's look at the definition. AI ops stand for artificial intelligence for IT operations. It is basically use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to enhance and automate various aspects of IT operations. AI ops platform analyze vast amount of data from uh, IT environments such as logs, event, performance metrics, and monitoring data. What is performance metrics, by the way? Any idea what is performance metrics? CPU, memory, disk utilization, bandwidth consumed by the application at every point of time. Those are performance metrics. The goal is to improve efficiency, reduce manual intervention from the team, and to enable proactive operations. These are the objectives from AI Ops. The core concept in AI ops. Now you will notice some of these things are very common or very similar to your data science. Data collection and aggregation. In data science and uh, data engineering also you do this. You collect data from various sources and then aggregation. What do you mean by aggregation? Anyone? You need to collect, combine, Yes, combine it into a proper data set. You might even have to ingest the data in real time. Now, what is real time data ingestion? There is a server who's producing logs and at the real time you are consuming them. You are reading them, processing them in the real time. Right? OK, so you collect the data, you ingest the data, you analyze, you process the data. What is the next task? Pattern recognition and anomaly detection. Now what is pattern recognition? Look at the data and try to identify the pattern. If the pattern is 
fine like it's a usual one this is how applications usually function then it's good but if there is any kind of anomaly is detected now what is an anomaly anybody anybody anyone what is anomaly anomaly means a slight change an issue anomaly means something is not good like for example there is a particular application whose cpu and memory utilization constantly remain at 60 or 70% but it randomly spike to 90% 99% and then comes back to 60% this is anomaly right so ai ops will check the pattern and it will detect the anomalies as well correlating events across the system what is correlating events across the system what is correlation by the way correlation means trying to analyze the historical data trying to analyze the data and identify two different seemingly disconnected event and try to check if there is any kind of you can say link between them it might be possible right yes like for example a user got some kind of error on e-commerce platform a user was trying to add a product to his or her shopping cart and suddenly system crashed suddenly system crashed how do you do a correlation exact same time when the system crashed go and check what that user was trying to do check what that user was trying to do now there was one possible uh, explanation for it like for example user there were multiple users who were trying to let's say add same product in their shopping cart at the same time and there were limited quantities available at that time right and because all of them are trying to access the same product or same particular quantity at the same time system crashed you can correlate it like that or maybe system crashed because at the exact same time system received your operating system required an important system update important os update important security update and your system was designed in such a way that whenever this important update was received system immediately restarted and trying to install that update as soon as it receives and because of that server crashed so that is correlating the issue identifying the issue by correlating with other events right can actually help you to identify what exactly is the cause of this particular issue so you can do that with ai actually you can do that only with ai if you try to do that with manual operation by the time you start studying it it's already too late are you getting my point hello what is benefit of using ai in this type of things to unrelated events ai will do it much faster than humans right humans will take or manual approach will take lot more time to understand and correlate the things ai can do it much faster automated incidents response and remediation like i said earlier a transaction failed an automated system will start reimbursement or automated system will start repaying the amount back or reverting the amount back to the customer's account no human have to do anything there right you respond to that particular event automatically so it is like there is a vehicle with adas level 2 as soon as it detects any kind of disruption or any kind of object in front of it vehicle will apply brakes on its own right and it will just give you a warning to a driver that there is some obstruction detected and it will stop itself there is no need for driver to put his feet foot on the brake pedal not required that is called automated incidents response are you getting my point hello automated response and remediation do not wait for human uh, intervention next is predictive analysis and forecasting what is predictive analysis 
learning from past data do a prediction okay so how you are going to or how you are going to actually carry this out further or how smoothly your operations going to run in future based on the past data okay based on past data so like for example a vehicle that shows you time to empty time to empty means you should be able to or you should be able to cover this much distance before your fuel tank is completely empty how to predict this efficiently learn from the past the vehicle will learn from your past driving habits right and based on it it will do a quick calculation how many kilometers you can drive unless uh, till the tank is empty but that requires some past data that is called predictive analysis forecasting in ai operations also you need this type of predictive analysis and forecasting that will allow you to avoid the future issues altogether see there are two things with reactive maintenance you can fix the issues as they are detected and with proactive one you can totally avoid them with proactive you can totally avoid them right that is for predictive analysis and forecasting the benefit is that self learning and adaptation ai system will continuously learn from its own past incidents and it will keep evolving in future and it will adapt okay and last point automation and orchestration automation is something which was there in it operations for many years now okay but before ai it was dumb automation it was like somebody has written a script to simply like a for loop to do a same task on multiple server at once we call it automation but with ai it would be a smart automation okay fine any question about these concept of ai ops definition and core concept anyone yes ai smart automation yeah i can give you an example in normal automation dumb automation you use some kind of script to automate the task some kind of script to automate the task in ai based automation ai system will actually assist you at many phases now this is not exactly an example of ai automation but i just wanted to show you some important uh, points about how ai can help you proactively now this is my github account now this is not from it operations but this will give you an idea now look at these type of messages which i have received from github look at the message here express 4.19.2 to 4.21.0 in angular demo 01 now there is i'm i'm using a ai assistant called dependabot from github dependabot available in github is giving me a small suggestion saying that one of my de angular demo project angular angular is a javascript framework angular project i'm using a dependency i'm using a third party dependency called express js inside my project i'm using express js version 4.19 and this ai tool is actually suggesting me that you should not use 4.19.2 but instead use 4.21.0 why because there is a newer version available for it are you getting my point this is generated by ai hello and did you notice it was commented and it was closed also by the bot so bot actually make sure that i am using all the latest third party dependencies in my project something similar to this will happen to your it operations team as well so let's say for example you were using windows server 2022 in your it infrastructure 
and Microsoft released a new update for it. Your AI tool will automatically take a decision on behalf of you. You simply told your AI tool that I want all my systems to be updated. And my first priority is all the important security updates from Microsoft. And your AI tool, you know what it will do? Every time Microsoft releases a new security update, your AI tool will go and check how many Windows servers this particular update is already installed. If it is already installed, skip them and identify those systems where this update is not yet installed and go and install it. And it will simply send a notification to you that I just did the scan. I found these where systems were not updated and I updated them. Is that clear, Shubham? And what would be a dumb automation? Dumb automation is you create a script. Your script will run every Tuesday at morning 2 p.m. 2 a.m. Every Tuesday morning 2 a.m. You go and check with Microsoft. Is there any new update available? If update is available, use a for loop and install that update in all your Windows server. That is dumb automation. OK, whereas the smart one is AI system will do all that on behalf of you and you just have to create a policy in most of the AI tools. You don't write a script. You create a policy. You tell AI. No, it both of them are not interactive. Both of them will run in background. Only difference is only difference is in case of dumb automation, you need to know a lot of scripting. OK, you need to create your own script to do the task. In case of AI, you just have to inform AI what you want and AI will do that for you. So you don't have to go and implement the stuff. You may not actually have to go and implement the stuff on your own. Many IT op, uh, IT administrators, they use some kind of tool to do the task. Like for example, I have created some time back. I have created uh, some Azure Quick Start templates. Yes, you can even use it in DevOps. Let me show you an example of a dumb automation or regular automation. OK, uh, around three years back, I created an ARM template. ARM is Azure Resource Manager template for deploying a Jenkins cluster with Windows and Linux worker node. This will actually deploy three Linux virtual, sorry, two Linux virtual machine and one Windows virtual machine using the script. Did you notice the shell script here? Don't try to understand it, okay? This is a shell script. And you know what the shell script will do? It will install, it will install Jenkins on my master machine. But guess what? In order to understand this, you need to know how to learn how to create a shell script in Linux. But what happens if I use AI? What happens if I want to use an AI instead? Let's say, for example, I want to use an AI. AI can generate a lot many stuff for me. Like, for example, Generate a shell script to install latest version of Jenkins on Azure Ubuntu VM. Now, I don't have to remember all the script or I don't have to write a script on my own. Script can be generated by an AI too. Did you notice how my copilot, Windows copilot, is able to generate? A shell script for installing Jenkins. And that too on Ubuntu system. Yes, now let's say my admin made a mistake. My admin generated a script for Ubuntu Linux, but actual Linux I'm using is let's say sent to us. Let's ask Copilot. Regenerate. The script. For sent OS. Instead of Ubuntu, let's see if my AI assistant copilot can regenerate it. Yes, now this is the script for installing Jenkins on CentOS machine instead of Ubuntu machine. 
Did you get the idea now? Shubham. Now, don't you think this will actually save a lot of time? Yeah. It will save time because a lot of stuff can be done by AI and you can delegate certain tasks to AI instead of doing it on your own. So it is like now I'm going to give you a very bad analogy, extremely bad analogy. It is about a construction site. You will find that many construction site, there are supervisors and there are actual workers. What is the difference? Supervisors are one. Supervisors are one who will simply monitor the workers, whether or not they are doing the task assigned to them. And workers are the one who is actually doing individual activity. Right? In case of AI, you become a supervisor and AI should act like a worker for you. Are you getting my point? I know it's not a accurate analogy kind of. Yeah. So please remember, you have to become a manager and AI should be laborer for you. If you become a laborer and AI become a supervisor for you, then your job is completely in danger. Okay. Yes. Then you can say AI will replace you if you act like a worker instead of a manager. If you act like a manager and let AI be your worker, you can make your future in whatever field you are in right now. Anyway, so your approach should be like that. And yes, you should still know a little bit of syntax because please remember whatever code is generated by AI, you should be able to read and interpret it. But anyway, you know, people nowadays use lot of different, you can say, uh, approaches for it. Like even if the code is generated by AI, you can even ask your AI to explain that to you. Yes. Is it explaining you every line in the script? Did you notice that? Uh, what I'm using right now is Windows Copilot. OK, but most of the generative AI tools will be uh, useful in here. Right now I'm using three different ones. I'm using Windows Copilot. I'm using GitHub Copilot and I'm also using uh, uh, the uh, code generation tool available from AWS. Yes, you have cloud AI, you have black box AI. Lots of AI tools are already there in market ratio. Yes. So these are some of the core concept of AI ops. So what are the differences? Traditional operation use manual analysis and static rule. AI ops on the other hand use real time AI ML analysis and they use continuous learning. What is continuous learning? Learn from your past mistake. That is what continuous learning is. Issue detection. Traditional ops use reactive manual and slower response time. AI ops use proactive, automated and faster response time. Event correlation. Traditional ops use manual correlation and there is a high alert fatigue. Whereas in case of AI ops, correlation will happen automatically and it will actually help you to reduce the noise and identify the root cause more efficiently and faster than manual approach. Traditional operations is reactive. AI ops is proactive. In traditional operations, operations people will ignore about the server unless there is an error. Unless there is an error. I'll give you an example. Uh, I will not name anyone, but let's say there was a government website, right? And the website was deployed two years back. And the team, IT operations team managing the website said, our website works totally fine and it had zero problems, zero errors at all. Everything was happening very good. But then suddenly government introduced some scheme. And for that particular scheme, everybody need to go to go and log in onto that certain website. And you know what happened? People started raising too many complaints about website. Right? And then production team or operations team came to know that website was never functioning properly at all. 
every time is in past whenever somebody will used to log in into a website and it used to crash these people never raised any question they are like okay this website doesn't work we'll go somewhere else that was happening nobody raised a question nobody raised an error and operations team were believing that everything is working just fine and there are no issues why because there were no issues detected or there were no issues posted by anybody but when people started posting an issue then it came to operations team view that the system is not perfect now proactive means you know you don't have to wait for somebody to raise a question or raise a query that is proactive scalability traditional ops it struggles with complex it operations ai ops can scale with the modern environment and with the modern cloud ai ops is scalable traditional ops is not much scalable so what we'll do now it's almost 12 we'll take a small break now and post break we will discuss few more points in here let me put a timer here we'll take a 15 minutes break just give me a minute yeah this is the break timer
Hello everyone. Uh, there's an announcement to make. So please raise your hand if you're in front of the system or hearing my voice or drop here in the chat box. Please raise your hand if you're in front of the system. Yes, uh, Joy Mishra and Sneha has raised their hand. Anyone else uh, back from the break? Okay, now I'll announce it. Uh, I'm dropping a message, please check. It's in badge redemption. Uh, so you have to just sign in and please check to the same information you have uh, registered. Everyone, please uh, please claim your badge and I have mentioned the instruction in the chat box so you won't face any issues. And please uh, drop the done while su after submitting or claiming your badge, okay? Okay, those who are done can keep your hand down. Please put your hand down. And uh, those who, who are back from break and uh, don't know the announcement, please raise your hand. I have shared the link to claim your badge. Hello, am I audible? The announcement uh, is the 
Hello. Please drop yes if I am audible. Yeah, you have to claim the badge. I have shared the link in chat box and mention the all instruction you need to follow. And please stick to the same information you have used while registering for the same webinar. Please mention done after claiming the badge. Everyone who claimed their badges, please, uh, can you raise your hands? Yes, Jay Kandelwar has claimed. Okay, keep your hands raised, please. Everyone, please uh, remind. Sorry, wait a minute. Everyone, please claim this badge as this will be added into your achievements. This is another kind of certific certification, so please claim this badge. Okay, we will start with the session now and who are not done with the claiming with their badge, they can do it after the session. Okay. Minus, sir, you can continue. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so yeah, we'll continue now. Uh, Jay has mentioned a question. We'll get a certificate for today's session. Uh, you should get a reply from uh, Sili or uh, uh, no, the badge is another kind of certification. You won't get any it's just other. Not same. Yeah. Right. It's a different badge. Right? OK. OK, uh, so let's continue now. AI ops and traditional ops. This is the difference that we are. There are some points that we differentiated between them. There are a few more points, by the way, in this in this uh, presentation. Last three points are resource management, automation and alert management. If you follow traditional operations, it's manual and inefficient. Whereas if you follow AI ops, it is optimized. It provides dynamic scaling based on demand, right? So better resource management when using AI. So it is as like your AI based automation tool will scale down the resources to reduce overall cost. OK, when it is not in much demand. And if it requires more resources, it can scale it up automatically. So let's take an example. Let's say you have your own streaming services on cloud, streaming services like Netflix, Hotstar, 
uh, Amazon Prime Video, something like that. Let's say you have created your own streaming services. Now, if initially when you started the service, you had very few customers, you don't need too many resources to cater demand of these customers. So what you do, you keep it scaled down. But let's say, fortunately, unfortunately, there was certain event, right? Certain new series, new movie, new documentary was posted on your platform and it suddenly got too popular. And now there are a lot many people suddenly logging in into your streaming channel to view that particular content. So number of end users sharply increased. If you were using AI ops, your AI tool will detect the sudden change, right, in the system. And accordingly, it will do a prediction. Okay, like this is getting more and more popular and the entire content is, let's say, of two hours time. So my prediction is like, you have to keep the resources up and running for at least three hours continuously. And then if the demand starts to subside, then we will scale it down. So that kind of dynamic scaling is one feature from AI. You know what is disadvantage of traditional operations, manual scaling? Let's say, for example, you get too much traffic on your website. So you ask your IT administrator, go and scale the services up. Now scaling services up manually only after receiving too much of traffic. Let's say it took half an hour for your team to scale the services up. But in those half an hour, there are a lot many content uh, consumers who actually gave up on your platform and they simply shifted to another platform to watch the same content. This can happen, right? Hello? Suddenly there is a huge influx, huge number of customers watching the content on your platform. And because your servers were not able to cater to their demand, it crashed. And then manually scaling up to half an hour, one hour. And meanwhile, many of the customers simply left and went to some other platform. This can happen if it is traditional ops. In case of AI ops, the system will take the decision and do the scale up and it will not wait for humans to react. That's the big advantage. Automation in traditional operations is limited and a manual process, whereas in AI ops, it is automated process. So is it possible for an AI tool to install necessary packages, updates, or configure system certain way, depending upon what operating system is there, what CPU architecture is there, and all that? Yes, it can do it on its own. And last, alert management. If it is done manually, there would be too much of noise, there will be too many static threshold, whereas AI ops can use AI based filtering, prioritization and correlation, which is more efficient than the traditional operations. What is an AI ops life cycle? Now this is very similar to how we do uh, use AI even in data science and data engineering. You collect data, you do a data collection first. integration and pre-processing the data, analyze and pattern recognition, identify the common patterns, then use those patterns to do a predictive analysis, to do a predictive analysis, and then use automation and orchestration to automate the workflows, common workflows, like it might be to scale up, scale down, or it might be remediation action, and then continuous improvement and a feedback. Learn from the previous incident and make sure the same incident never occurs for the second, third time. And finally, prepare a report visualization. So uh, I will explain you all these points in detail. The first point is data collection. Collect data from various IT sources. Now, if you are into data science, in data science as well, there might be data collected from multiple sources at once. Instead of depending on data from one source, it's much better to get data from more than one source, right? To get the quality data from multiple sources and correlate them. How do uh, people who study history, okay, people who study history, how do they make sure a certain event in history is accurate? They collect information about that particular event from multiple different sources. And if all the sources are confirming about that particular event in history, 
then they make a conclusion yes there is a high probability that this particular event actually took place right because there are so many supportive evidences about it similarly here in ai ops it's much better to collect the information from multiple sources collect the server log collect the application log collect the cpu time matrix memory matrix lot all type, type of data and then make conclusions based on that data integration and pre processing get the data from multiple sources clean the data if required clean means remove the noise and do the further analysis analysis and pattern recognition what is analysis and pattern recognition after you do the analysis identify the pattern identify the pattern like for example let's say you were processing or you were monitoring your application and you came to know that every day at morning 9 am every day at morning 9 am your overall cpu and memory utilization of your server goes to 90% and then it remains at 90% till 11:30 am uh, 11:30 then at 11:30 it goes down and then it again goes back to 90% when it is 2 pm and then again it goes down to 60% when it is 5:30 how can you use this pattern hello how can you use this pattern for your own benefit one way to use your pattern so i will just repeat it again let's say for example you were managing a server and application and you notice that every day at morning 9 am every day at morning 9 am the cpu and memory utilization of your application goes to 90% then it gets down to let's say 60% when it is 11:30 after around 2 and 1/2 hours then again it goes up to 90% at 2 pm and comes down to 60% at 5:30 so that means your application is actually facing lot more lot more workload in time 9 to 11:30 and then 2 to 5:30 how can you use it for your benefit now you will increase or you will scale up your resources at let's say 8:50 am you scale them up 8:50 am means 10 minutes before the actual event and then at 11:30 you scale them down because you may not actually need it to give you an example hotstar an indian uh, streaming channel every time they had some kind of uh, live streaming of cricket matches you know what they do before they start live streaming of cricket matches they scale their servers up they pre scale it they don't wait for actual number of customers to log in they do that 10 minutes 15 minutes before the event and then once the event is concluded they will scale down all their server back to the regular one what is benefit in doing that remember one thing just like any other business business perspective cost cost overall expenditure and customer handling or customer uh, or pro providing a proper better services to customer how do you balance them out you balance them out by scaling up your services because you know that you need higher demand you even can see this difference in most of the indian markets if you now now this is a diwali season if you go and visit any shop any uh, let's say clothes shop sari shop for example you will notice in the season the shop owner will invite additional people from maybe from their native village and you will see suddenly in a shop regular days there used to be just three or four attendants and now there are suddenly eight to 10 people working in the same shop why because they are expecting more customers it's a festive season right so they scale their workforce up and once the season is over all those people additional people they will send them back to their village have you have you noticed this type of change in local shops as well this is proactive approach 
This is proactive approach. It's not like all the people in your shop are already busy handling customers, and then you call someone, right? And ask your uh, friend in village, send two more boys because I'm facing a staff shortage. That is reactive. That is reactive. Okay, so we have data integration, processing, pattern recognition. Identify these type of patterns. Yeah, like a data analyst and like a data science, right? A little bit role of that. But uh, most probably, most of the AI based automation tool do that on behalf of you. Okay, now next predictive analysis, forecast potential issues based on historical data. There could be an historical data, like for example, your AI tool already know that every few, uh, let's say month, quarter, months, or year, your operating system releases a new update. Let's say for example, every four years, this is a recurring event, every four years in April month, Ubuntu release a new distribution, a new distribution. And let's say you are, your organization policy is to make sure that all your Ubuntu servers are running latest version of Ubuntu, latest LTS version of Ubuntu, which is released in the month of April every four years. So can we identify, can your AI tool identify this pattern and do a prediction? Like now let's say in one month from now, a new release will be published by Ubuntu. So one month before, your system will take all the necessary precautions. Let's say it will deploy a new empty server, keep it ready for the new version of Ubuntu. As soon as it is available, take it, install it, configure it, and then transfer your workload from the old Ubuntu system to the new Ubuntu system. That kind of operations it can perform, right? It can forecast these type of things. Automation and orchestration. Automate the response and orchestrate the actions, whatever actions you have to perform. Orchestrating actions means, for example, scaling up, scaling down, terminating the server instances, and so on. Continuous improvement and feedback. Many a time it might happen that your application is actually facing performance issues, not because of application itself, but the main culprit might be your database. Uh, by the way, if you people have worked with data science, do you know how many different types of databases we use nowadays? It's not only relational database anymore. Is there anybody who has worked with non-relational database? Non-relational? Non-relational like no SQL databases, basically. You could use Mongo, you could use Redis Cache, you could use etcd, right? Or uh, there are plenty of them, by the way. In open source, there are plenty of NoSQL databases there. Your AI tool can even detect. That's fine, Sneha. Your AI tool can even predict that most of the time, MySQL is a relational database. Most of the time, there are operations tool which can suggest whether or not your database is actually giving you an optimal performance. And it might, it might even make a suggestion that your relational database, your application is running smoothly, running fast, but your database is the bottleneck. So it might suggest you a different database, right? Most of the AI tools, they use their own AI models, which are built with several applications using different database. Like your AI tool might suggest that similar application when deployed with, let's say, MongoDB database or Cassandra database, which is NoSQL, gives you better performance than MySQL or Oracle DB. I'm just giving you an example. That might actually help you to further improve your project, its, its performance. And final point, reporting and visualization. You can use the report, you can use the dashboard, insight, analytics data further for your own learning later on. So this is the AI operations life cycle for us. So what are key benefits? Now this is just a recap kind of. First one, predictive maintenance and automated remediation. Number two, proactive issue detection 
and incident management. Number three, resource optimization and scaling. You can scale down your resources to a lower level or upper level as and when it is required, right? And you can proactively detect the issues before they arise or detect them after they arise and automatically fix them, right? So it is like your team will simply monitor, supervise the system and system will take the corrective action as and when required, that kind of approach. So with this, we completed first module, which is AI Ops. OK, I hope everybody is clear about AI Ops now. AI Ops is artificial intelligence with operations. Our next module is monitoring and incident management. And this time I'm going to actually show you a small demo of what is monitoring and incident management, AI powered monitoring and incident management. Now for this, I have a sample application deployed on Azure. I guess I did not actually deploy it. I will deploy it now and I will show you how the AI based monitoring systems actually look alike. By the way, I'm using Microsoft Azure, which is a cloud platform, a public cloud platform. And I'm going to deploy my application here. It's a pre-created application, basically. I have already built a container image of that application, which uh, will integrate with uh, AI-based monitoring service called Application Insight. So let me quickly deploy it. This is my application resource group, and let's name my application as my sample 1010. I'm going to use containers and this is a Linux based system. OK, and everything else is fine. I don't need any database, but I definitely need a container image. And my container image name, just give me a minute. I have a ready to deploy application. OK, these are all the container images I have built in past. OK, yeah, this one library API AZ Insight. This application, I have pre-created this application to integrate properly with AI based monitoring tool, uh, uh, which is called Microsoft Application Insight, Microsoft Azure Application Insight. It is already pre-configured. I just have to deploy a new instance for it. And for monitoring, now this is the important place. What I'm going to do is I'm going to enable application insight for this. Now this application insight is a monitoring tool from Microsoft Azure, from Microsoft Cloud, and it can monitor my application. OK, it can monitor the CPU memory metrics. It can even learn from the logs generated by my application and lot many different stuff. So let's deploy this. It will take approximately three to four minutes for the application to be ready. I guess everything is fine now. Let's go ahead and create this. This is going to take around three to four minutes for the application to be ready for me. Let's go down, go back to the presentation now. Uh, yeah, Shri Krishna, you have if you attend this training uh, till the end, you will get a link to uh, watch this uh, session later. OK. Yeah. Fine, so. Now, monitoring and incident management. How AI can enhance monitoring tool? Now, how, what are monitoring tools? Monitoring tools are basically tools who will monitor all the servers and uh, applications in real time. AI-based monitoring tool will actually check how your application is working in real time, and based on that, it will give you some kind of suggestions. It can detect anomalies. It will identify what things your application missed, it will identify the real time system behavior, everything it can do. OK.
So how does it enhance the monitoring part? It can detect anomalies. It can monitor the system behavior in real time. It can learn from the patterns. It can raise alerts and it can correlate unrelated event. This is, these are the points we have already discussed a uh, few minutes back, right? Incident management, identify the service disruptions or failures automatically. Now I'm going to give you a real example of this. But for this, we just have to wait for this particular application to be ready. Let's go and check if application is ready by now. Looks like it is ready. And this application right now, if I try to access the application now, Okay, it's still deploying. It will take around uh, one or two minutes more for the application to be ready. But once my application is ready, I will show you how it will actually do a real time monitoring. Please remember, as your application insight is not the only tool that does AI based monitoring, there are many other third party tools also available in market that also can do similar activities that can do the similar things. Similar features. Yeah, I guess it's now ready. Let's hit the browse button and this is my application. Basically, this is a small REST API. OK, and you will notice there are basically three APIs here. Book issue, book resource and member resource. And uh, this is basically the documentation uh, built in documentation for them. Like there is an API endpoint API slash book. And if you fire this. It will give you a data in JSON format like this. It is fetching two pro, uh, two books for me. Right? So let's see how it can actually use AI based monitoring. Application is already deployed and I'm using a tool called Application Insight, Azure Application Insight. So let me show you something interesting now. Under monitoring, let me show you the metrics. Let's check. The CPU time metric. Maximum. So you will notice this application, the CPU utilization was very low till this point here, right? Till 1237 PM. But at 1237 PM, the CPU utilization has suddenly increased to 1.50 milliseconds. Sorry, 1.50 seconds. Right? You can see the up here and then it is backed out. What if you want to add one more metric? Let's say I want to add one more metric here, which is memory metric. Uh, this is a memory matrix. For memory also, I need to find out the maximum memory here. Looks like memory and CPU both are actually on the same level here. You can also check the file system usage. How much file system? Oh, there is no such usage reported right now by my application. Can you see these details now? Number of HTTP 101, number of HTTP 200, 300, 400. These are called metrics. These things are called metrics. Health check status. And lot many other different things like HTTP 406, 404, etc. These are called metrics. Your monitoring tool is giving you all those metrics. Now, other than these metrics, as your application inside also will be able to capture few additional metrics. Now to simulate that, to simulate that, let me try to deliberately make some mistakes. Let's say, for example, I'm trying to fetch a book with ID 1002. Now let me tell you one thing in advance. There is no book 1002 in my database. So if you try to make a query like this, it's going to give you 404 error. Let's see that. So I made a request and I'm getting 400 error. Did you notice the 400 error? It's saying book you were looking for does not exist in a library yet. Now what happens if user made this request several times? Second time and third time. So there were total three times user request for a book that did not exist. How a mon monitoring person will know about it? An operation team will get all that data from application inside. Let's go to Azure application inside and you can see you are getting all those metrics here. 
number of failed requests. Did you notice how many requests have failed? Here it is saying there are total four failed requests so far, right? And this is called correlation. Now, please pay attention. This is a very important point. What is event correlation? Right now, my cursor is on this. At the same time, when I got four failed requests, at that time, my server response time was this, right? At the same time, my server number of requests received by server was this. Are you able to see the correlation in here? If I keep my mouse pointer here, it for the other metrics, it is showing at the same time what were the values on, on those metrics. You can see it here, right? This is correlation. OK, fine, but I'm not actually looking for co-location co right now. I was looking for something else. Let's go for. We are in application insight now. Let's go back to the overview panel of application insight. And here, let's try. Wait a second, there is an option here to check the. Yeah, you can see how many user sessions are there. Number of user sessions, number of users connected. Important events in the given application. You can actually explore all of them. Right now, right now there are zero sessions because this is a stateless application anyways. For this particular application, I can also get a dashboard. Now, what is a dashboard? A graphical report that gives all the necessary information in one single screen. Let me show you how the dashboard will look alike now. This is my dashboard. Let's see what all information it is actually giving to me in a single screen. You can see the reliability. Here it will show me number of failures, then responsiveness. It will show me the performance of my application, right? And this is where application map is. Let me show you the application map now. Did you notice this? Hello? How many application instances I do have? For my current application, there is only one application instance and it has one SQL database. Did you notice this 4 MS here? Can anyone to tell me what exactly this 4 MS is? Anyone? Any guess? Yes, Shubham. It's four millisecond. So right now my application insight is telling me that my database is working just fine. And on an average, on an average, the communication between application and database is taking four milliseconds. There were total 18 calls happened between application and database. And you can even see here this query took 7.5 milliseconds. This one took 6.6 .6 milliseconds and this one took 4.5 milliseconds. Did you notice that? Hello? This is called real time monitoring. And this is just one of the many AI ops tool which can do this type of real time monitoring. Do you want to investigate the performance issues? Click on the button and it will give you even more data. Right, so let's look at this. Did you notice all this data here? You can see a performance of every SQL query. So by the way, can we use this data to identify if in your application, if any particular database query is taking longer time to execute? To give you an example, if a particular database query is taking longer to execute, you might ask your developer to further optimize that query. Is that clear? Hello? Yes, this is called real time monitoring. OK. This is the real time monitoring with something called application inside. Yes, and please remember, AI is not integrated by me. I am simply using a product called Azure Application Insight. Azure Application Insight is using AI, right? 
to identify all those issues and do all this analysis. I don't have to create, train any model. I don't have to use ML, machine learning. I don't have to build my model. I don't have to create any algorithm for that. The product will use AI on behalf of me. Is that clear? Yes, AWS CloudWatch is also a monitoring service, by the way. And inside AWS, the similar service in AWS is called X-Trail. OK. In Microsoft Azure, it's called Application Insight. In AWS, it is called X-Trail. Yes, Abbasi, you can use Dynatrace operator instead of Application Insight. Dynatrace is basically a third party product. And what would be benefit of using Dynatrace instead of Azure Application Insight or AWS CloudWatch? Number one, Dynatrace will work. Dynatrace will work it, work for uh, local on premise systems also. For AWS, it is X Trails, okay, which is part of CloudWatch. This is how you can write. Oh, wait a second. It's they just call it cloud trails now, not X trail. Cloud trails. Yes, they use open telemetry. Open telemetry is basically an open source API. Uh, both Dynatrace, Azure Application Inside, and Cloud Trails from AWS, they all use open it, open telemetry behind the scene. Okay. If I just go back to application insight now. Wait a second. Let, let us check number of failures. And you will be able to identify number of failures here. And let me show you something. You can see most of the failures are related to API slash book ID. And let us go back and check more detail. What were what were those errors? Let's see here. User was trying to find a book number 1002. This is exactly what I did, right? Hello? Right? You can see the details here. So this is what has failed. And it will even show you how many times it has failed, right? All the traces and everything will be available here for you. Here it is. which actually resulted into a select operation which failed. You can even see the query it is using on a database. Now, don't you think you can give, if you give all this information to your developers, you can expect your developers to work and improve performance of this application, right? You cannot just randomly tell your de uh, developers that please improve performance of your code. Then developer will counter uh, ask a counter question. What part of code you want me to improve? Now you can specifically tell them, like this is where your performance is bad or this is where application is failing. Is that clear? Yeah. Now, these are all monitoring features. Now let me show you even better features from application inside. And that is, wait a second, I just need to go back to my application insight here. And let me show you something called smart detection. OK, these are truly AI driven services like, for example, slow page load time. I want Azure application insight to actually raise an alert if my application is becoming slower over a period of time, like for example, one hour back page was loading in 10 millisecond, but now it's taking 20 millisecond. So it is slower than earlier. Show ser slow server response time. Long dependency duration. Dependency means uh, like for example, every request data need to be fetched from database. So what if the data fetch from database is taking longer time? It will detect that. Degrade in server response time degrade in dependency, degrade in trace severity issue, 
abnormal rise in exception volumes. Yes, all these are alert features which are using AI behind the scene. Let me show you the information about that. This rule will automatically analyze exception thrown in your application and can warn you about unusual pattern in your exception telemetry. Is that clear? So whenever it will detect an anomaly, it will notify you about those anomaly. These are smart monitoring tools. Yes. Now, Abbasi, this is all done by the monitoring tool. Every monitoring tool has its own dashboard, its own user interface to get inside and check the detail. But you cannot expect people to always log in into the monitoring dashboard and view all the detail. That's why they send you the alerts. Right? They will send you an alert over an email or some different messaging platform, right? Like Microsoft Teams chat, for example. They will notify you about certain important uh, uh, alerts on some channels and others. You can just visit a dashboard and view that. Now, if you use some kind of third party tool like Dynatrace, right? They have their own monitoring dashboard. Yeah, let's get back here. So incident management on monitoring both could be supported by monitoring tool. Now let's take a use case now. Unexpected spike in e-commerce application. Let's say you have built, you have built, deployed, and you are currently managing e-commerce application for one of your client. Now, suddenly, because of some reason, e-commerce application is suddenly getting too much of traffic, right? And that too much of traffic, maybe there is a flash sale. Your customer declared that we will be having a Diwali sale and they are giving heavy discount and suddenly there are too many people logging into the platform to do a purchase, which actually are creating performance issues now because suddenly there are too many people connected. Individual page load time has increased. Response time has increased. Latency has increased. Now, how can you work on it or how your AI tool can work in this scenario now? So what your AI will do? The proper steps here are automatic detection. What is automatic detection? AI tool will automatically detect metrics like CPU, memory, response time, etc. They will identify the anomaly. They will identify anomaly. If the CPU and memory resource utilization is increasing, right? If anomaly is detected, then it will go and find, then it will go and do the alert and correlation. It will send you an alert about abnormal activities and it will do a correlation. Why this is increasing? Like for example, if CPU and memory is increasing, then it will check how many users are connected. If number of users connected and amount of CPU and memory use, if they are able to correlate it, if they are able to correlate it, they will do some kind of preventive action on it. Like for example, every time your user count increases above 1000 user. Every time your application's current logged in user count increase beyond 1000 users, your CPU and memory utilization skyrocket and after some time your application crash. Now this is a normal trend. You know what AI tool will do? Next time when there are 1000 or more users logged in at the same time, it will trigger scaling up your application. Are you getting my point? Hello? AI will work like this. From the past data, it knew that after you have more than 1000 users logged into your platform, your platform's overall resource utilization increases and then it crashes. So it will learn from the past record. Next time when there is 999th user logs into a system, it will start scaling your services up because it knows once the once the number goes beyond 1000, the overall system utilization is going to be up. So it can do that kind of correlation. It can also do a root cause analysis. What is root cause analysis? What exactly is the root cause or main reason of the downtime or of the cache crash? It might be a database, for example. 
or it might be a network component. What do you mean by network component? Let's say, for example, you have a typical uh, multi-tier application. Your front-end application need to communicate with a back-end application, right? And front-end to back-end communication is taking longer time when there are more than certain number of users connected. It can do an analysis and it will tell you what is going wrong. So maybe it will give you a solution, something like this. Your front-end and your back-end are too far away from each other and there is a higher network latency detected there. So it might give you a suggestion like try to bring them closer. OK, your back end and your front end. Reduce the gap between them. Try to make them as close as possible or maybe increase the network bandwidth between the front end and back end to improve a performance, something like that. That it can do in root cause analysis. It can do a predictive analysis, as I told you earlier. It will use different model to identify what are the chances of failure of your system. Right. And then automated resolution. It will find the solution and apply the solution automatically on its own. Post incident review and continuous learning. If incidence is resolved, it will create the necessary logs. It will build its own algorithm to detect the same issues, same future issues, right? and what corrective action you have taken on that issue. OK. Did you understand the use case here? Hello? So let's take for example, in this scenario, uh, automatic detection. It found that there is a significant increase in CPU utilization and longer response time. Then alert system will send the notification to the operations team. Then it will perform a root cause analysis. Let's say, for example, root cause analysis has identified the higher CPU utilization is because of database, right? Your application is trying to fire some SQL queries and those queries are taking longer to execute. Let's say that's the reason or that's the result of root cause analysis. Now what AI will then do? AI will then predict what is going to happen if you don't fix it. Like for example, AI might say that if you don't fix it now, your database will most probably crash and will not respond to your application. And what happens if database crash? Your application will might also crash. So it will give you an alert saying that if you don't fix it now, your application and database both will be down. So users will get work on it and fix it if it is manual. Or if it is possible, you can do an automated fix as well. But in case of database, it is your developer team who has to find some alternative there or find some solution there. To give you an example, many of today's applications, modern application use database caching or some kind of caching tool to improve the performance of database queries. Do you know any caching tools? Anyone? Are you aware of any kind of caching tool? Like Redis cache can be used as a caching tool. So what it will do? It will get the data from the original primary database, keep it with it, and next time when application need exact same data, it will get the data from cache instead of getting it from database. So it will reduce the overall load on the server, but developer has to do it manually. AI tool cannot modify your application and include a caching service into it. So this could be one example now. Incident management, what is benefit of using monitoring with AI? Faster detection, minimal downtime, reduce human effort. You as a human, you don't have to do much things and predict predictive prevention. It will actually help you to prevent the issues from happening. So what are the examples now? I already gave you example of Azure Application Insight, which is a cloud based monitoring tool for applications. It is basically application monitoring tool, APIM tool. OK, there is another third party tool available called Dynatrace. Dynatrace is product from a vendor. It's a third party product, full stack monitoring tool for applications, servers, database, and it has built in AI. 
If you visit their website, you will get more information about Dynatrace. Let's see what Dynatrace uh, tell us about their own monitoring tool. So here it is. A cloud or on premise, whatever it is, a monitoring tool for faster and better analytics. You will get a dashboards like this one, right? You can trace all the activities. You can get the server and application performance all from the single tool. Is that clear? You will get a dashboards like this one. You can even pinpoint like which particular server is giving you more trouble. These are kind of a dashboard you will get. And one good example is or one good benefit is single Dynatrace can actually be used to monitor multi cloud, hybrid and on premise servers and application at the same time. Can you see the amount of features available here? Application security, log analytics, application observability, and others. This is Dynatrace, third party tool. Then we have Datadog. Datadog is also another third party tool for infrastructure application and log monitoring. Another one is New Relic. Again, New Relic is also a tool which is used for monitoring applications and servers. New Relic. Now, I have a question for you. Like you may or may not have directly worked with this tool, but does your organization use any of these tools for application monitoring? You may not be part of the team. Looks like there is a competition between these two tools. And they have actually put a monthly observability cost comparing themselves with other popular tool. Now, as per New Relic, uh, this is their marketing data. Basically, they are trying to sell their product. So New Relic says that your monthly cost, if you use New Relic, would be $2,000 compared to Datadog, which will cost you $10,000. So they are just trying to you know, compare themselves with their nearest competitor like this. Yeah, and looks like New Relic is available for these many different platforms, including MySQL database, Python, PHP, Node, Java, and .NET. If you want to see all the integration, it's available here. So all of them use AI, by the way, nothing new in that, right? And the last one in my list is Splunk. Splunk is very popularly used by OSS developers and they also use monitoring tool which uses built in AI. Okay, this is now taken over by Cisco. Cisco is the company behind Splunk now and Unified Observability Platform. Let's see some dashboard examples. Yeah, this is kind of a dashboard you will get in Splunk. Notice the dashboard here. Hello. Giving a summary of everything at one place, like there are 12 critical issues. There are 38 high level issues, 43 moderate issues, and there are total 1417 issues which are resolved. Are you getting my point? And if your application is actually available in multiple geographies, it is showing you network distribution or health in all those geographies. Did you notice that? Now, by the way, here you can see this is a chart showing six different locations. Currently running processes. These many processes are currently running. This is the response time currently. You have 80 millisecond response time. There are 43, 400 errors. There are 285 X errors. You get a dashboard like this one with your AI based monitoring tool. This is another Splunk dashboard. Now, most of these AI tools actually allow you to customize your dashboard 
as per your own requirement. All these dashboards are customizable. You can choose what all panels you need to place in there, which panel should be big, which panel should be small and all that, right? The, those are monitoring tools. So is your organization is using any such tool? Yes, Shubham, that was aggressive marketing, comparing directly with the competitor. Naming your competitor, yes. Okay, Sneha has mentioned Prometheus and Grafana. Prometheus and Grafana are open source tool. And one thing that makes them separate is you can just install and use Prometheus and Grafana for free. There is also a paid version available. I have used both of them on my Kubernetes cluster. And when used together, you can create a nice dashboard like this one. Is that clear? These are Grafana dashboard. Grafana is basically a front end and Prometheus is kind of a back end to collect the data. Prometheus will collect the metrics data Share it with Grafana and Grafana will convert it into a nice visualization. OK, and all these dashboards are customizable dashboard. You can customize them as you need. I'm not sure about solar wind, but we can check that. Okay, so you will see there are a lot many different third party tools available. Now this is from SolarWind. I'm not sure whether they are using AI, but please remember as from the monitoring tools perspective, if there is any monitoring tool which has not yet integrated AI, it will be far behind in the competition now. So looks like SolarWind has also launched their own AI based tool to transform IT service management. So you can get get more details about it from their white paper. The question should be which one is actually using more AI, right? Most of them use AI in one way or other. Right, but uh, tools tools like uh, Datadog, Splunk, tools like uh, Dynatrace, they are heavily dependent now on AI. Okay, and they continue to grow their overall AI usage. Grafana and Prometheus is not using much of AI as of now. It's more like a manual monitoring tool. Okay, but uh, I guess there are some uh, you can say paid version of uh, Prometheus libraries or Prometheus based monitoring tools available, which can now incorporate uh, AI into it because both Prometheus and Grafana are open source. So it might be possible for somebody to build their own Prometheus, which will combine the Prometheus native code with AI and build something new on top of that. Quite possible. Yeah, so so many different monitoring tools to choose from. All of them are strong competitors to each other. And by the way, if your organization is using any one of them, there is no need to go with the other one. It's very uh, why what I have commonly observed that once an organization starts using Datadog or New Relic, right? They will start more using them. Now, if you notice, yes, Abbasi, you are right. New Relic is not even competing with Dynatrace and Splunk. They don't even consider it in their documentation. Their competition is with Datadog only. Splunk is also based on open source libraries, right? And Splunk is more, you can say, popular with ITSM. Okay. Yeah. So there are so many different tools to use. Your organization can choose the tool based on how more efficient it is, what is the cost for it, and other things like 
compatibility and all, whether it can work with your on-premise environment, whether you, it can work with your cloud environment and so on. The demo application which I shared with you as your application inside, it is using this Docker containerized application. If you have as your subscription, you can try it on your own. Okay. So that's about monitoring. We discussed something called monitoring. Now the next module is about automating the operations themselves, IT operations themselves. Please remember we are not actually discussing any particular monitoring tool because if we start talking about these particular monitoring tool like Splunk or New Relic, it will take much longer for us to proceed. And then it would not be a generic module. It would be a module only for IT ops people, operations people. It would become meaningless for other job roles. Are you getting my point? Yep. We are trying to make this module as generic as it is possible. Fine. So now automating IT operations. Yes, you can automate IT operations. Now when I say IT operations, these are the operations which can automate. Capacity planning and resource optimization. What is capacity planning? What is capacity planning? How much space? Yes, you mom, you are on a right track. So basically, I'll give you an example. Long back, around six, seven years back, uh, one of my client, we were discussing some possibility of migrating to cloud. And I got a request. They told me, Mahindra, help us to identify what capacity we need on cloud for our on-premise application. We have an application running on-premise. We are planning to migrate this application on cloud, but we are little confused. Where to migrate? Shall we migrate it into a virtual machine or application service or containers? What we should do? And I told them, I cannot simply tell you by looking at your application what capacity you need on cloud. I need some monitoring data. So I asked them a question. Are you using any kind of monitoring tool to monitor your overall IT resources which are running on premise right now? I need that data first. I will analyze that data. How much capacity was reserved for your application on premise and how much capacity it is actually consuming? Are you getting my point? Because you know what happens in on-premise resources? People either over-provision them or they under-provision them. What is over-provisioning? Hello? Over-provisioning means allocating more resources than required is over-provisioning. And under-provisioning is providing bare minimum resources which actually affect performance. So you need to do a right sizing. And I told those people, it need me, it, I, I need some time to analyze your on-premise servers, your application, read the monitoring data, and based on that, I will do a proper study, and then I'll create an assessment report, and then I'll tell you what should be the right size or how you should deploy this, how you should migrate it from on-premise to cloud. Believe me, any organization who's planning to migrate their workload from on-premise to cloud, right way to do that is get a help from an expert. Ask an expert, get an assistance from an expert. Expert, expert will analyze your workload and identify what is the right solution for you. And once you get the solution, then you can use a cloud team to implement that. Without any monitoring tool, you won't be able to do that, Sneha. Because how will you know what is the right size for your application? You know what is worst case scenario? If you don't do a proper study, I have seen many a time people simply migrate application without a study and then client complain that when my application was running on premise, it had a better performance. And after I moved it to cloud, performance is degraded. That is number one. And number two, now I have to pay monthly certain amount to my cloud vendor. In case of on premise, it was just one time payment, or there was more initial investment. Later operational expenditure was far less for me. 
Something like this happens if you don't have the monitoring data. Right now, what if what if your application is already being monitored by some monitoring tool and you simply ask your monitoring tool, hey monitoring tool, what if I plan to migrate this application now on cloud? Now, what if your my monitoring tool itself or your AI tool will analyze your application workload and suggest what is the right size on cloud for it? That is capacity planning. AI tool can predict amount of compute and storage that you need for your application on cloud or whether you need equal amount of resources all time. It can give you that kind of suggestion, right? You do not have to depend on a human expert for that. Are you getting my point? Hello? Right? It is like, let me give you an analogy for this. Let's say you had certain symptoms of fever and cold. What you normally do, you go to a doctor. Doctor will analyze your condition, ask you a few questions. Based on this, doctor will do a diagnosis and prescribe some medicine for you. That is a standard method. Now, what happens if you try to do a self-diagnosis? A self-diagnosis may not be accurate and it might fail. There are chances of failure with self-diagnosis, right? You need an expert for that. But what if you use an AI tool? Let's say there is some kind of AI tool which can monitor your health metrics and recommend a medicine for you without any need for visiting a doctor. That is what AI can do. Now, let's not use it for medical. Let's use it for IT operations. OK, so you will get capacity planning. You can optimize the resources all through AI tool. Chatbot and virtual IT assistant. Now, what is virtual IT assistant? You know what happens? Let's say, for example, your organization you has assigned a laptop or a desktop to you, and you need to install some additional software on it. How you will do? You don't install anything directly on those machines, right? You have to raise a support ticket for it. Are you getting my point? Hello? You have to raise a support ticket. So let's say, for example, for a very small activity, you had to raise a support ticket. So you raised a support ticket and now you are waiting for it. Now what ITSM systems, manual ITSM systems will do, they will take the support ticket. They'll assign the support ticket to the available human resource. That human IT operation or IT support team member will actually coordinate with you and try to fix your challenge and then it's closed. That's the manual approach. But what if you have some kind of chatbot or some kind of virtual IT assistant who can do all that quickly without any need for assigning a human? Are you getting my point? Hello? You can directly talk with virtual assistant, right? Chatbot or virtual assistant. This is also based on AI. By the way, I have a question for you. Artificial intelligence has multiple different subcategories, right? Do you know what kind of AI is used by or what kind of tool is used by chatbots? Um, not generative AI. Generative AI is still a broader concept. Conversation AI. Yes, Abbasi. There is also another term for it. Natural language processing. Natural language processing NLP. What NLP does with the help of NLP, you write a message in a human language and your chatbot will use NLP to understand what do you mean by whatever you have written there. Are you getting my point? Yes. So next time, next time, if somebody claims that they are using AI based virtual assistants, right? And if you ask that virtual assistant a question and if virtual assistant gave you an error saying that I did not understand your question, please format it like this. Please format it like this, right? Then it's not an AI. It's a normal chatbot without AI. How do you identify a chatbot which uses AI? It should be able to understand what you mean. Let's say, for example, XYZ Bank has a chatbot. And you can connect with chatbot for any information. Like, for example, you wrote a message in chatbox. 
what are the current FD interest rate? And chatbot gave you a message. I did not understand your question. Please specify what information you want. And then it gave you a prompt. Information about savings account, information about deposit, information about loan. Then you choose information about deposits. Then it will ask you next list. Information about FD, information about RD. Then it's not AI. Got my point? Shubham, Sneha. It's not an AI. It's just a normal tool. If it is an AI, it should be able to understand the question which you have written in human readable statement, right? And it should be able to quickly answer back to you instead of asking you further questions. You should not ask user to frame question in particular way if it is a chatbot or virtual assistant. Anyways, next point, change and configuration management. What is change management configuration management? OK, I will explain you this way. Long back, long back, somebody has set up NGINX, which is a web server, right? NGINX on a Linux machine. NGINX by default use NGINX.com configuration file to define all the configuration. And there was one server where whatever changes people were doing to NGINX.com, the changes were not reflected in actual NGINX. They were trying to change uh, website mapping, log folder change, lot many things. Whatever configuration change you do to NGINX call, it was not working at all. And they didn't know why it is happening like that. Yes, configuration. Configuration means configuration file. You know, many softwares use some .ini file, .conf file, something like that for configuration. So in that case, you know what has happened? When we try to backtrace why it's not working, we come to know that some time back, an administrator who was struggling with NGINX, you know what he did? He created NGINX.conf in a different directory than default directory. And the current NGINX was referring to the other NGINX config and not the one which is found in default directory. It was configured differently, right? Any change in system configuration can affect your system. And AI can detect this type of non-compliant configuration changes. If we use AI, AI tool can tell us that your NGINX is poorly configured. Why? Because the configuration file is supposed to be placed in etc slash NGINX folder, but somebody has put it into VAS slash NGINX folder. It can detect configuration changes. Are you getting my point? And if required, they can even revert them to the approved setting. OK, let me give you another example. There was a server on which RDP protocol must be disabled. A Windows server with RDP must be disabled for obvious security reason. But somebody raised a query, a support ticket, and in order to fix the issue, one administrator need to remotely uh, administer or remotely manage the server. Right? So what they did, they simply enable RDP for temporary access. Did the work, close the connection, but your administrator forgot to close the RDP connection or disable the RDP back. Now, if you are using AI tool, AI tool can detect these type of changes and automatically fix them. Like this server, RDP is not supposed to be active. It will go and deactivate you. Yes. Now, there are two approaches available. Some people use audit mode. Audit mode means identify the configuration mismatch and report the mismatch to the administrator and let administrator, a human, fix them. That is one approach. Audit mode. And then remediation mode. What is remediation mode? You want system to automatically fix it. Don't wait for human to go and fix it. Are you getting my point? So what is benefit of this type of automation? AI automation, increased efficiency. Things can be done faster, more efficiently. Number two, reduced human error. The chances of human making an error are higher than automation system making an error, building an error. Enhanced security and compliance. You can tell your AI tool that you want your entire system to follow this particular security and compliance policies, and AI will enforce it. 
on behalf of you because humans many a time make a mistake humans do make a mistake like for example like i told you a few minutes back you were working on some windows server so you temporarily enable rdp access to it but you forgot to close it it's like you opened a more security door right but you forgot to lock it back once your work is done ai driven system will do that for you right faster is issue resolution and cost savings cost saving i guess i have already discussed that many times by now understood the benefits of ai in it automation now use case let's say there is a financial service company who is experiencing an intermittent service downtime what do you mean by intermittent service downtime that means their application is not at all reliable it goes down for through 2 to 3 minutes then again starts back up then again it goes back for 10 minutes again start working automatically fixed those are intermittent which is bad basically it gives you a very bad customer uh, experience you can use ai automation tool to identify issues with these type of systems what it can do it can identify the anomalies if there are any okay and it can also uh, do the automatic scaling if it is required it will flag the unusual spike in the traffic and identify a specific api endpoint whichever it is as a bottleneck let me give you another example have you heard about ddos attack it's a security system basically let's see what is ddos this is ddos a hacker what hacker will do hacker will use multiple bots to send unwanted traffic or too much of traffic to your servers at the same time and instead of sending all the traffic from one server your attacker is sending traffic from multiple location at once this is called ddos what is it called ddos now why i am explaining you this let's say you have some kind of monitoring server which is backed by ai and you know what that ai will do the ai tool will check how many request you are receiving from multiple users and what if what if system is receiving multiple identical request concurrently same time from multiple locations what do you mean by that hello what if the ai based monitoring system detects that there are several identical request being forced to your server at higher quantity from multiple location the system will detect it as a kind of a ddos attack and it will raise an alarm and not just that it will also track the server from where it is receiving those repeated request and it will add those server ips to a blacklisted ips it will simply blacklist them so the same ips cannot in future do the similar attack and this can be done with ai ai based tool now uh, like in azure we have azure monitor for example which can which also provides ddos protection azure virtual network has ddos protection policies which can identify these type of attacks and it can block them in real time okay these are kind of anomalies automated scaling i already told you so whenever required scale the application up without using any human intervention and self healing correcting on its own last point ai in cloud management can we use artificial intelligence for managing cloud answer is yes you can use ai in cloud operations let's say for example there is a e-commerce company retail hub which is experiencing fluctuating cloud resource demand throughout the year during seasonal event like holiday sales ai based tool if they use ai based tool the ai based tool will suggest scaling their application up and down based on the holiday sales or holiday season right 
they can use that, right? In case if they want to use that, what they have to do first? Number one, data collection and monitoring. They need to collect all the data. Data means what was the overall system utilization in holiday season and what was all system utilization in regular, normal, base, base mark, base, uh, uh, sorry, uh, what you call it, benchmark, regular benchmark, right? Collect the data. Number two, forecast and auto scaling. Based on past data, do a forecasting. A forecasting will tell us like this is the time when you are supposed to get higher demand or this is the time or this is when you will get more load, more workload. Then based on the forecast, do the cost optimization. You already know that one month from now, you are going to get higher workload or increased load on your server. So you plan it accordingly. Are you getting my point? You plan it accordingly, right? And then incident detection. If there is a security incidence, performance incidents, or any crash or fail occurs, do an automated remediation. Compliance monitoring. And finally, continuous learning and optimization for the next year, probably. So that was end of module three, which was IT operations with AI, automation with AI. Now, predictive analysis for AI. What is predictive analysis? It is same point, actually. We are just repeating the same point in a different module. Machine learning is basically, uh, you can say, uh, human friendly, user friendly, most uh, basic, or you can say overly simplified definition would be to teach machines how to do a prediction or how to process your data, how to process the information. So you can use ML for predictive maintenance. Like for example, I used a uh, artificial intelligence in application monitoring as your application inside. That was a real use case for that. So using machine learning algorithm and statistics. Now you don't have to do this. Most of the time this is done by the monitoring tool themselves, right? So these tools have used machine learning algorithms and statistics to make the prediction. OK, and they use these models or they use these algorithms in their own tools to monitor and remediate issues in your application. What kind of predictions you can do? Customer behavior prediction. Like, for example, what happens when you have uh, let's say some kind of holiday season like Diwali vacations. So you do a customer behavior prediction and you do and identify what kind of products customers would be more interested in in this particular holiday season. That is customer behavior prediction. You can use AI for this. Customer behavior prediction. An ML algorithm, a machine learning algorithm can predict what would be customer demands now or what and how customers are going to interact with the application so that you can improve your application to satisfy those customer demands. Demand forecasting, Sorry, customer behavior and then demand. Forecast the demand, demand for a particular product, seasonal trend, weather, everything based on that. Predictive maintainers, when do you need a maintainers? Now, let me give you an example. How many of you regularly receive kind of a text message from your bank saying that on this particular date, let's say, for example, Saturday midnight, 1 a.m. to 3 a.m., all the banking services will be down and not available to you. Why they choose timing like that? Any reason for selecting a time slot like midnight 1 to 3 for doing a maintenance activity? They know that no customer will be doing any transaction at that time, right? That's why they choose a time to do a maintenance activity that time. So AI ML can forecast what is the right time to perform and what should be the, uh, you can say, right time and right set of maintenance activities to do, when and what maintenance we should do, at what time. 
data can be collected from multiple sources and your AI based tool can suggest when you should do a maintenance activity. Maintenance activity could be anything. Simple updating a new version of application on application server, updating application version or maybe some kind of maintenance activity on database and so on. You can also use for risk management and fraud detection and you can also use it for health and medical forecasting. So ML can be used and machine learning can be used for multiple different scenarios here. Same thing, proactive decision making. You should be able to take decisions in well in advance. Cost efficient, you can minimize the cost. Risk reduction, but by either by addressing the issues before they arise, proactive monitoring and remediation, you can therefore reduce the risk and improve customer experience. Now let me give you an example. Let's say there was a product which is using proactive AI ops, proactive monitoring with AI ops. Server was down for 10 minutes. It sent a message to all the customers that sorry for the inconvenience caused to you by last 10 minutes and customers were like, but I didn't feel any difference. Now don't you think those customers who are getting messages like this, that there was an issue with the system and we fixed it, but they themselves never face that issue. They will be happy customers. Are you getting my point? Right? And then there is another set of customers. They face the issue. They raise the support ticket to fix it. And now they are waiting for the issue to be fixed. Are you getting my point? Hello? So what kind of tool you can use for machine learning and AI? There are lots of frameworks available and I guess now, now this is time for data science and data engineering guys. What kind of tool do you use for machine learning from this list? Yes. So there are Python based libraries like scikit-learn, TensorFlow, PyTorch, which you can use for model training, tuning, and deployment. There are data visualization tools like TableU, Power BI. Then there are auto ML platforms. There are data management platforms. There are model deployment and monitoring platform like you can use Azure Machine Language, MLflow, or AWS SageMaker, which are cloud-based services. And if you want something like data processing, you can use something like Apache Nifi. All these are machine learning tools, basically. By the way, using these tools, you can build your own monitoring tool as well. I guess it doesn't make any sense, right? Instead of you building your own monitoring tool, it would be much better to use a monitoring tool which is pre-built by some vendor like Datadog or Dynatrace. Are you getting my point? Hello? It is possible to build your own monitoring framework, monitoring platform, or you can use a monitoring platform which is already created by somebody else. In case if you plan to create your own platform, these are the tools and frameworks you can do for data analysis. So can a manufacturer com manufacturing company use Predictive maintenance for machinery to avoid unexpected breakdown. Manufacturing company means any kind of manufacturing company. Right? Any kind of product they might be manufacturing. What they should do? They should do a data collection. They should do a feature engineering. Train the model. The model will give them some kind of uh, predictions. Deploy and then monitor. So like for example, Data collection. If it is a manufacturing company, most of the manufacturing companies nowadays use some kind of automated systems to manufacture things in large scale. And most of those machineries might have some kind of sensors. Are you getting my point? Sensors. There might be a maintenance log. There might be a usage statistics. Now, let me give you one unconventional example. Unconventional example. Do you know that uh, almost all vehicles manufactured after 2015, 
they had some kind of onboard diagnostic system. They have some kind of onboard diagnostic system installed in them. Nowadays, there are lots of new solutions available which can gather real time data from your vehicle and give you a suggestions in real time. A system connected system, connected car system, for example, where the system itself will gather data, sensors and everything, and it will give you a notification. Your car will send a notification to your mobile that you need a maintenance or you need a service now, a full service now. You might have to service your tires, you might have to service your, uh, let's say, uh, brakes, clutch, etc. It will collect the data, check the sensor data, maintenance log, and accordingly, it will create a required alert for you. Are you getting my point? Hello. It can use the historical data, right? Because not everyone need same amount of maintenance or same frequency of maintenance, right? So one user might need frequent servicing, another user might need infrequent servicing. Even then, which component to service also depends on their regular wear and tear. And if there is a system which can collect all the sensor data, read the log, do some onboard diagnosis, and then give you a suggestion like you need to do servicing for only these components, that would be more useful to the users. Are you getting my point? Hello? Hello? So if you are able to do a right diagnosis this way, it will always allow you to reduce the overall expenditure, overall cost, because system is not asking you for the full service. They are saying, okay, this is the component which needs servicing, and you just do that, right? So that's it. We have discussed things about, yeah, feature engineering is like, for example, uh, if it is a machinery, it can collect the average temperature for it. Like, for example, uh, a regular usage, a regular usage report reported by the other users. OK, like, for example, I'll give you another example for a car can calculate the mileage value. OK, like, for example, same car to same car model, but different users or different use cases. User one, his car is saying the mileage is only 15 per liter and for the other user it is 18 or 20 per liter because their usage scenarios are different right one person use it on city roads one person use it uses it on highways right feature engineering means calculate the values which are uh, you can say uh, aligned for a particular use case for this particular machinery Let's say, for example, an average temper temperature of this component for other users is 50 degrees Celsius. But the use case or you are might you might be using it in a let's say little humid area where the average temperature for you may not be 50 degrees or 60 degrees, but it might be 70 or 80 degrees feature engineering. That is individual feature about uh, whatever machinery you might be using. It will identify and calculate the values for current use case. OK. Individual features, IoT sensors you can use. Yes, IoT is Internet of Things basically, and it uses lots of sensors and everything to collect data and send that data for further processing. OK, so like, for example, uh, uh, if think of Tesla, an automobile company, all their Tesla vehicles they collect uh, onboard diagnosis data and send that data to their servers for additional processing. That's how Tesla will know what all features in their car people are using more frequently and overall usage pattern. They can use this data to further improve their next product. Right like that. OK, I, there is also an example of feature engineering, for example. About Tesla again, you know what they do? They provide certain services to their customers on subscription basis. Like, for example, if you want ventilated seat, you have to pay a monthly subscription for that. Right. 
they will do a scan like how many people are actually using this service, how popular it is. And there is now this is not connected to AI and ML and AI ops, but if you don't pay a subscription, if your subscription expire, car will automatically disable a uh, ventilated seat feature for you, right? And if you want to enable it, start the subscription again like that. That is features, individual feature engineering. Right. Now, what is future of AI ops? With AI, you have to first define your objectives clearly. You know, a very common question people ask, is AI going to replace a developer? How many of you had similar question? Is AI going to replace developers? You had that question? Shubham had that question. Chat GPT is a generative AI, Abbasi. Right? Yes. Now, let me put it this way. You know what is the most difficult thing in software development? It's not actually implementing the code or writing a code. It is understanding customer requirement, understanding user requirement. It will help, but it will not replace. Why? Many a time, yeah, logic building is more important than writing a code. If you already know the logic, you can use that logic. You build the logic and let AI generate the code based on that logic. AI will not build logic for you as far now. The current version of AI, it will not do that. It will just support you, right? Not replace you. But you have to have the clear objectives. If your objectives are clear, if you yourself did not give a clear instructions, right? AI will fail to work, right? Yes. Sometimes the prompt you enter, now there is another Filled in AI called prompt engineering. Search on internet to know more about it. You should know how to get the things done from AI. There is a speciality in that. So you have to have a clear objectives there. Invest in high quality data. Please remember AI, ML, deep learning, whatever you use, it requires a high quality data. It requires quality data input to build its model. Then. Start with small, high impact use case. You cannot suddenly start using AI ops, or you cannot suddenly start using AI. Start with a small, high impact uh, case study, and then start growing with it. Do not suddenly introduce AI in your organization. Start small and grow big. Integrate AI ops with existing tools and process. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is a possibility that you might be already using an operation management tool Let's say something like Dynatrace, which already has AI built into it. Right? You don't have to build a new tool or you don't have to invest in a new one. There are chances that you can integrate your existing tools and processes with AI. Right? Because you know what? We humans, we don't actually like change. We don't actually like a change. Any reason why we are using QWERTY keyboard? You know, there are multiple keyboard layouts. The one we use in India is QWERTY keyboard. QWERTY keyboard is where uh, the top row is Q, W, E, R, T, Y, U, I, O, P, like that, right? Because we are more used to it. Now, what if somebody will come back and say that instead of QWERTY, you use this, a different keyboard layout, which is, it is much faster. But what is use of that much faster keyboard if you have if you are missing your key presses every time because muscle memory, your hands are already know where to find Q and W. And if you change the keyboard layout, there are more spelling mistakes you are going to make. You are used to it, as Neha has mentioned. So use AI ops with existing tools and processes because your team has already familiarized themselves with those tools. Do not introduce a completely new tool. Then your team need more time to learn the new one. Focus on explainability and transparency. Focus more on transparency and things should be explainable. You should be able to explain the things, right? Please remember, if you are using ChatGPT to generate a code, like Abbasi has mentioned, you are a developer. You generate a code snippet from ChatGPT, put that code in your application, build successfully run. You know what would be the most bigger challenge? When other team members comes to you and they ask you, 
What did you do? How come your application is working just fine? Tell us how this code works. That will be our issue now. Last time I discussed this with one of the developer with more than a decade of development experience. I asked him, what is your opinion? What is easier to do? Explain why your code didn't work and explain why your code worked. And he told me, Mahindra, it's much more easier to explain people why your code didn't work. Right? You can give a lot of excuses why it didn't work. So there should be an explainability. There should be a transparency. Transparency means whatever, whatever AI policies, AI tools you are using, you should be transparent about it. Right? It is like somebody is using chat GPT behind the scene to generate a code, right? And is hiding that information from other members, right? There is no transparency in it. Okay, you should be able to, you should be able to provide more transparency there, and you should be able to provide more, or you should be able to explain the things. This is the main thing you have to uh, worry about when using AI. Please remember, Transparency will actually help you to build the trust in AI system. Then cross-functional collaboration. What is cross-functional collaboration? AI goes beyond multiple stream. People in data science use AI. People in IT operations will use AI. People in business, uh, like MBAs, business masters, they will use AI. And they will all be, you know, using AI for their own respective role. So there is a proper collaboration required. And last, monitor and continually improve. The AI available now may not be perfect. Right? The AI available now may not be a perfect one. There might be still some gaps. There might be still some things that need little more, little bit more fine tuning might be required. But it will keep on improving in future. So based on that, you also have to, you cannot totally depend on content generated by AI. You need to still do a fine tuning on it. You still need to fine tune it as per your requirement, as per your use case, right? Okay. Continuous, continually improvement is basically applicable to all the fit. Now, what are the challenges in AI implementation? One challenge is AI ops require large amount of clean and structured data, but the actual IT environment offer contain bad data. Let me give you an example. If an organization has 100 servers up and running, and if you ask their team out of these 100 servers, what server is actually providing what kind of application support, it is very difficult to understand that. You will be surprised to know that if you ask randomly an IT operations team what this particular server, server A is, what is role of server A? They will say, we don't know what server A is doing, but every time we shut it down, there are three different applications crash. We don't know how it is actually working or how it interacts with the servers, other application, but every time we shut down the server, three applications crash. That's why we keep the server running. This is the actual use case. And if you build your AI model on faulty data, the results will not be accurate. So first of all, you need a clean structured data. Right. Number two, complex quality and management. What is quality and management? The data must be clean. Yeah, like I, I told you earlier, right? And it should be a quality data. If your AI model is built on a wrong data, the results would be wrong. Like for example, uh, in AI, there is a uh, there is a field in AI called computer vision. Everybody who are aware of computer vision, CV? Hello? Computer vision is an AI technology that can be used later to do a face detection, for example, to do a face detection. Now, what if you pass a wrong data to it? There were a model data shared with you, and the data itself was bad. 
the data itself was bad and using the bad data you build a model and the resulting model when it is actually used for computer vision you show him a picture of dog and it says it's a cat right it's because it is built on a faulty data or incorrect data so you need a proper data quality to be maintained you need proper environment complexity and integration integrating it it operation solution into legacy or existing solutions could be challenging so you should use more modular approach one module at a time or one component at a time interpretability complex ai models like deep learning can be difficult to interpret making it challenging for it team to trust ai driven insight please remember there are always old people old guys who still believes in old legacy method like for example way back before ides integrated development environments were built people were using something like notepad or vi plain text editor to write their code build it from command line but when ides were introduced there were still people who were hesitant to use ides they were like no we don't believe in this new technology we will continue to write our code in notepad they did that then there were cloud based ides have you heard about cloud based ides like there is no need to install anything in your machine at all just log in into a cloud environment launch the ide and it will open inside a browser there are still people who are not ready to use that right yes because there is a basic human tendency to to be afraid of something new which you cannot interpret which you cannot understand so there should be an interpretability rather most of the ai monitoring tool behind the scene they use ai but their dashboard looks same old dashboard like a legacy system they themselves use ai right but they don't share that complexity of ai usage with their end user so end user will feel more comfortable with the same tool skill gap now this is important point if you are planning to use ai ops in monitoring your application and server you need to explain your team what ai ops is and how it works right if there is a skill gap obviously people if they are afraid of using a new tool right if they do not know about new tool like i said just one minute back afraid of new basically unknown afraid of being afraid of unknown fear of unknown so skill gap there might be a skill gap you might need to uh, you can say explain your existing team how ai ops work and what are benefits of it okay maybe your organization might have to invest a little bit in training training people on how to use those ai tools right that will actually help them to better use particular ai tool change management like i said earlier significant changes to the workflow like before ai you used to do something manually after ai you would use a different way to do the same thing that change management that transition should be properly defined and properly explained to your team and cost now why there is a cost now because so far almost every 2 3 slide i was saying there is a cost benefit but now i'm actually putting a negative point high cost any justification for this hello okay let me put it this way you are using a third party ai ops tool right the ai ops tool themselves has invested heavily in ai artificial intelligence to for the betterment of their tool right and now if you use these third party tools like datadog or uh, new relic they have subscription price or license cost like earlier when I, i took you to new relic website they were trying to market themselves they were comparing their cost with the datadog cost there is a high cost there is a possibility that your existing operations management tool or your existing tool might be much cheaper than the new tool which uses ai 
So high cost could be a challenge. There might be people who do not wish to go with AI based tool because of high cost. Like for example, in India, if you want to purchase a car with ADAS, it will be much costlier, right? And cheaper ones, affordable ones are those without ADAS. Are you getting my point? Hello? Right? So there is always a one customer base who will not go with this new product. Why? Because the product is costlier than the old legacy product. Unless the legacy product completely disappear from the market and users no longer have any other options. Till then, they will continue to use the alternate legacy option only because the cost is less for it. Is that clear? That's the challenge and pitfalls. So that's it about what we were talking about uh, AI so far, the future of AI. You will get more and more predictive and prescriptive AI. You will get more and more integration with multiple cloud and hybrid environments. You will have more AI ops models. You will have more, more self-healing systems. You will have more better enhanced and uh, security and compliance model. And, and in future, AI will extend or AI ops will extend to edge computing and IoT as well. It has already basically expanded to IoT and uh, uh, edge computing, right? Uh, Abasi, there is another issue here. If you use observability or if you use open telemetry, open telemetry requires its own libraries to be embedded or included right in their project, right inside your application. So before integrating observability, your application required two CPU and let's say four GB RAM. After including observability telemetry module, its CPU and memory utilization might increase a bit. So there is an indirect cost to it. Are you getting my point? Hello? Hello? Yeah? Just uh, three, three months back, I was using AWS Cloud Tales. So what I did, I enable AWS Cloud Tales, and I told AWS to monitor all the activities, like account login, logout, and everything. And you know what happened because of that? I did not use my AWS subscription for last three months, but every month I was getting a monthly bill of four rupees nineteen paise. And when I tried to find out why I was billed this much amount, I got to know that. This was the charge from AWS Cloud Trails. Okay, for the data it was capturing. Then I went ahead and I disabled it, deleted the resources and everything, performed a cleanup, and now I hope my next AWS bill would be zero rupees. Right? So there is a cost involved. AI ops will be later on expanded to accommodate more self-healing systems, more better security and compliance. And they might get expanded in edge computing and IoT as well. Okay, IoT, Abasi has mentioned earlier in uh, Internet of Things. There are a lot many smart devices which has their own sensors will capture the data and send it to their central service for more processing and analysis. Right, AI ops will soon cover these type of devices as well. So that's it. So in this session so far. We discuss everything about AI ops. So as a summary, I will just put a few points in front of you and then we will conclude this session. Number one, AI is artificial intelligence. Ops is operations. Operations refers to daily maintenance or upkeep of servers, application and overall data center operations. Making sure your services are available to your customers 24 by 7. That is main responsibility of operations. Operations maintenance is very complex and it, it is a very costly service, a complex service, and you need a proper team to take care of your servers and your application, your overall workload. AI can help you in this type of complex scenarios, right? Now, you, server to admin ratio would be much lower. Without AI, if one user can manage five servers, with AI, one user, one admin can manage 500 servers as well, right? 
Yes. So this will basically allow businesses to do their operations more efficiently. Please remember whenever you are using AI for anything, AI for data science, AI for machine learning, sorry, AI for data engineering, AI for operations, AI for DevOps, whatever it is, you must be the one in control, right? And AI must be just your, AI must be the laborer and you must be the supervisor there. If you do that, you can use AI and you can do the same thing that you were doing earlier, but in lesser time and more efficiently. Any questions, any queries, anyone? Yeah, Sneha, the, the role we are discussing here is operations, system operations. People who are responsible for monitoring the server, application, network, storage, everything. People who are responsible to make sure services are available to customer 24 by 7. That is your first question. DevOps and AI ops, difference. DevOps can use AI, right? And by the way, DevOps actually, as you can notice, it is made of Dev and Ops both. So AI Ops is actually part of DevOps. AI Ops is actually part of DevOps. But what are the other areas in DevOps where you can use AI? Like for example, in DevOps, we normally have workflows like CI and CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery and deployment. Can you use AI to generate CI CD workflows automatically on the flow so that you don't have to write Jenkins file, you don't have to write GitHub action, you don't have to write Azure pipeline on your own. Your AI tool will generate it for you. Yes. Or another example, an AI tool which can scan your application dependencies and tell you whether you need an update, like I have done it in uh, the first uh, uh, first half of this uh, event, right? Yes, AI can do that. Now, yes, there are multiple different tools for that. Like the one I mentioned here, I'm using something called GitHub Dependabot, which can scan my dependencies and it can notify whether any of the dependency requires an update. But fortunately or unfortunately, Dependabot will scan dependencies in Git repositories only, GitHub repositories only, not your local code repositories. Okay. But I believe there are other tools also as a replacement. Uh, the badges will be available uh, like if you follow the document or if you follow the link, uh, badges would be available and uh, uh, you can apply those badges on your LinkedIn profile. You can include it in your LinkedIn profile. Am I right, Saili? Hello? Yes, yes, sir. yes sir. Yeah, so she will explain you how to use that. And Sally, please explain them about this point three and point four as well. That is a batch as a certificate and how to use the recording or when the recording will be available. Okay. Okay, sir. No problem. Yes. Well, thank you so much, sir, for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Well, I hope you found the webinar insightful and informative. And remember, the conversation doesn't end here. And feel free to reach us reach out to us without any hello am i audible i hope i'm audible and you can hear me yeah feel free to reach out to us with any further questions or comment well i am resharing the feedback uh, url so please take a moment and fill this out and uh, just uh, give thumbs up and uh, text done in the chat box after submitting the form. And Sneha, uh, the recording will be available by Monday and will be sharing by Monday to your personal mail ID. Okay, everyone, you can leave after filling the feedback form and please remember to claim the badges 
as you have invested so much valuable time